coming right there. All right, hey, gents, welcome back to Tactical Rifleman. This is Tactical Tuesday. I got a couple true American legends here. And uh, John, want to uh, thank you for being on with us. And thank John, you. always a pleasure. Long time no see. John Stryker Myers, John Plaster. Um, it, guys, it's a total pleasure. When they said... They, they reached out to us and they're like, hey, Carl, uh, we, we want to be on your live stream Tuesday night. And I was just like, <laughs> that just blew me away that you guys actually wanted to come back and do this. Well, I had so, so much uh, fun. I had to come back. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate that. Indeed. And uh, for all of our viewers out there, um, I sincerely, we, we're very glad that you guys want to be here. We have, uh, Before we get deep into the weeds, I got a couple sponsors that are supporting us tonight. Uh, you guys know the deal. Big Daddy, uh, Sportsman's Guide, first off, uh, is supporting us. They're our loyal sponsor. They've been here 90-something Tuesdays, which I think is awesome. we got a promo code for them, Tactical20. Big Daddy Unlimited. I hope uh, Big Daddy and Mrs. Big Daddy are... Uh, watch, I just found another tick. Another tick. We are just out in the yard. i got a bunch of ticks all over us. So don't go out in the yard with Mac V. Sog guys. They'd be... Dragging in all the criminal elements. <laughs> right, um, uh, Global <clears throat> Ordinance sponsoring tonight. 80% Arms is sponsoring again tonight. The reason why I love 80% Arms, John, you, ever, you, you know what 80% Arms is? One of those companies that they make the guns like the lower of an AR, but no serial number. But it's Ooh. only finished 80%. They give it to you with a jig. You finish the other 20% and it's not registered with anybody. Any car 15s? Uh, they do. They can do car 15s. Uh, they also do. Uh, they do like Glock lowers and stuff. Uh, a couple different companies that do that. I like 80% arms. Uh, yeah, good stuff. My EDC pistols actually 80% arms Glock 19. The reason why I want you guys to support 80% arms is because Sloppy Joe and uh -huh. Harris do not like. 80% firearms. So if you want to take Uncle Joe, Sleepy Joe, and rub him the wrong way, support 80% arms. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. And then Safe Life Defense is also sponsoring us tonight. They got plenty of armor in stock. Use promo code Tactical Rifleman, all one word, and that saves you 10% off of everything. Now, back to the important shit. These guys right here, John. Um, I was telling I was telling John earlier. For those of you that don't know who John is, I didn't know who John is. You knew, but you didn't. know. I knew, but I didn't know. <laughs> so everybody and a lot of these guys have heard my story. When I decided, uh, I was in junior high school. I saw the movie with John Wayne, the Green Berets. I decided right then and there, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a Green Beret. I know what I'm gonna do. And most kids, like my son, he's out of college. He still don't know what he wants to do. Right? No, that's okay. It's okay. So I I was driven. But once I got in the military, my recon platoon and everything, um, you don't worship J John Wayne and Hollywood actors. You, back then, this was uh, the late 80s, you, of, of everyone out there, it was Mac V. Sog guys. Mac V. Sog, Mac V. Sog. And there was one book, uh, I actually have, this is like my third one, um, SOG. A lot of you guys know this book specifically because it's on my Amazon book list. Of all those books, most of them are reference books, like uh, Where There Is No Doctor, Where There Is No Dentist, uh, the Foxfire series, a lot of survival books, SAS survival books. There's very few books there that are uh, history books. Most of them are reference books. There's one that is historical fiction, Gates of Fire, about uh, about the Spartans, Spartan 300. Uh, again, good book because it references stuff that happened, actually happened in history. But out of, there's no World War II books. There's no Korean War books. There's no Desert Storm books. There's no Afghanistan books. There's no other combat books except for just one. SOG and uh, a lot of my patrons uh, and when I go talk and I uh, teach classes I reference this book 
all all the time. And when uh, when Tilt said, "Yeah, I'm gonna bring uh, John Plaster up tonight," I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> I I didn't connect it, dude. And yeah. You don't read the bylines. I don't read it. Who the hell reads the bottom line? <laughs> John L. Plaster. So, hands down, my favorite uh, piece of recorded data ever on the planet. Uh, John Plaster, brother. Indeed. A great book. Thank you. Um, you just shook the hand of the SOG writer's godfather. There you go. There we Indeed. go. And, and the, the cool part <laughs> is uh, Chad was like, yeah, hey, he wrote this other book uh, called uh, Ultimate Sniper. And I'm like, no, 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 I got that one too. That's that's written by this other guy. And <laughs> <laughs> Chad held it up in front of me and he's like, John L. Plaster. <laughs> so brother, I just want you to know, you have literally stepped into a place where there's a bunch of hero worship going on. And I want to oh. thank you sincerely for your service. <clears throat> Um, I, I see it on Instagram every now and then people saying, you know, Hey, that, uh, that old world war two vet you see with the, the cane and the Walker wearing the world war two vet hat, you know, he was at one time, he was more badass than you'll ever be your whole <laughs> yeah. life. And uh, that's the way I, I look at you guys. So, um, no matter what happens and I ask you guys, you better keep that chat room PG 13 tonight. <laughs> I, I know Susan and Sherry Champagne. They're they're already checking out your guys' nipple the rings makers. and stuff. They'll be talking yeah. about your nipple rings for hours. And <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just who we have here. It, it is what it is. It really is. It is what it is. So um, where do you guys want to start? How do you even start off with this? Where do you, where do you guys want to start? Well, I I would like to say I've written three books on SOG okay. and some, some other books, the History of Sniping and the Ultimate Sniper, which is a handbook, instructional. Yep. When it comes to SOG, I consider myself an ambassador. Uh, yes, I served three tours in SOG and I did all the real shit, yep. despite the PG. <laughs> <laughs> but I was the luckiest soldier in the world to have served Okay. With the men that I did in SOC. They're absolutely the best. That's awesome. And they're absolutely worth it. I had to wait 25 years before I could write that book. Now, elaborate on that. Why did you have to wait 25 years? Was it just you putting together the stories where there were restrictions <laughs> on a lot of it being classified? Um, Everything we did was top secret. I, I know, even the I existence yep. of SOG yeah. was classified. Even the secret. NDAs were top secret. Well, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like We've tied non-disclosure yeah, agreements. Yeah, yeah, everybody, yes. you know, everybody knows Delta doesn't exist. Yeah, everybody right. knows Delta doesn't exist. But everybody, uh, you know, everybody. There's there's Delta movies. There's hmm. SEAL Team Six movies. Everybody, you know. Um, but you guys were legitimately the real deal back in the day. You were getting stuff done, doing things in Vietnam that the they troops just don't do fighting today. Yeah. did not even know we existed. They had no idea anyone was operating cross border along the trail. I think honestly, we looked at ourselves as supporting all the troops who were fighting in South yeah. Vietnam. Our yeah. job was to collect intel and make the North Vietnamese pay a cost. For every kilometer, they sent troops, equipment, or ammunition down the trail. That's awesome. Now, and I know a lot of you oh, yeah. are half my age, which <clears throat> makes you one-seventh their age, because these guys are <laughs> a little older than me. Um, Mac V. Sog, but it, you guys aren't familiar. Um, North-South Vietnam, yes, but then they, the Ho Chi Minh Trail actually ran in the nearby countries. Laos, Cambodia, and it was a way for them to politically run stuff all the way around because the American troops weren't allowed to cross. Yeah, the, supposedly, supposedly, both those countries were yeah. neutral. Yeah, they're yeah. neutral. Right, so neutral. Neutral, right. yeah, exactly. Um, so when the Swiss say that they're neutral, and like just that just makes me not trust you, you know. <laughs> no, it's, that's the truth. It, it's, there's no such thing as neutral. Um, so they would bypass, and you know the Americans w had their hands tied, which that's that's not fair. It's liter it's literally not. So I sometimes wondered if our greatest enemy was the North Vietnamese, 
or the U.S. State Department. Because they put Ooh, so yeah, many restrictions oh, on what we were trying to do. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Chad stacking books. Indeed. The Bibles. <laughs> we don't have tilts here. Where's tilts? I have no, tilts. No, no, I have no, tilts no, no, books they, here. These are the ones that were before tilt, and these are the ones that have all the details that inspired me to get to, to writing on it. So and Thank you as well. I welcome everyone who writes about SOG <laughs> because it's such a dramatic story of true heroes that we were fortunate enough Oh, to yeah. fight with and serve with, and I want them to get that recognition. And Absolutely. that's why I love what Tilt's doing. If you guys are not familiar, and I, if you guys understand, I love that you guys are here with us uh, on Tactical Rifleman right now. More important, though, is, uh, like John just said, w one of the things that um, Tilt is doing is he's bringing in Mac V. Saw guys, and he's doing a podcast where you guys can actually go and let John Plaster and uh, Major Plaster and all these other yeah. McVie SOG vets tell their story. And I think it's so important that this gets documented. So I applaud you, Tilt, for doing that. And uh, once he gets it rolling, how many episodes you, you got under the belt? John will right be now? number 10. Number 10. Number right, one so zero. Where do we, where do I send all these monkeys? Yeah, if you look to the side and the back, the, the one in the back, that's Erica. And Eric is a freaking nutbag. All right. But there's a She's bunch of people nutbag. out there watching you right You're now. You're looking past a bunch of nutbags. Just nutbag. to point out the nutbags. She's a little <laughs> taller than the rest of them. All right. So uh, where do we send them? Where, right now where they're, they're at the audio book. We're, we're doing these uh, thanks to uh, Jocko Willing yeah, Productions. Yeah, Jocko. Yep. So he's the one that's bankrolling this, gave us the equipment. And then we're doing the interviews based of, off of the uh, people we served with. Okay, so they go to Jocko's? And, uh, um, no, the, they, right now, if you, the quick way is you just uh, Google SOGCAST MACV. SOGCAST Mac MACV SOG. And they should pop up. There's four so far that have been, um, they're an audio. And at some point, they're going to be available as YouTube. And it's one step at a time because okay. Jocko's production company with Echo Charles is right-hand man. Okay. They're doing these over time along with everything yeah, else they're yeah, doing. Uh, I'm sure he's busy as hell. He's a little uh, busy. I've never met Jocko. Uh, <laughs> I've heard I've heard great things about him. I just know uh, anybody doing... I'm not good at the social media stuff. I'm so That makes not two of us. <laughs> Three of us. Yeah, yeah. So his um, wife and my wife are... <laughs> <laughs> my lovely wife, Gail. I, I gave it all to her. I yeah. get reminded yeah. all the Hi, time. Hi, Gail. I know she's watching. Yeah, I talked yeah, her on yeah. to the target. Yeah, okay. Indeed. Uh, yeah, my wife reminds me all the time that, you know, you got a choice. You can be good at this and just do entertainment jackassery, or you can be legitimate and actually try to help people and educate people, but understand, Carl, doing that, you're never going to get any views. You're never going to make any money. And I told him, like, honey, I'm not, you, you knew when you married me, I'm not good at making money. I'm not. That's not, mm -hmm. why, I, <laughs> not why I joined the military. So um, it's all good. It's all good. So have John uh, tell us about himself and then tell us about uh, how they met Carl. That's something that I'm getting hit up. Okay. Uh, the Inquiring Minds, you tell us um, in, a in a nutshell. I know you've heard this before, but <clears throat> I arrived as a replacement in the Trang Vietnam without a further assignment in Special Forces. And I ran into a guy in the club that I knew, and he said, hey, how'd you like to go do the real shit? I said, what do you mean? He said, the stuff you joined special forces for. And I very, well, I can't say stupidly, because he was right. Yeah. He, in fact, he said, well, you might get killed, and that, but there that are a lot of right good there. deals, but there are a lot of good deals. <laughs> you, know, so you get a week off anywhere in South Vietnam you want. They give you neat shit you don't have to turn in when you go home. Wow. But more than anything, it was to do the, the direct action Special and Forces mission. They started it off with, you might get killed. And that sold it on you right there. Well, you know, everything's <laughs> risky. I didn't exactly go Special Forces no, exactly, to beat the draft. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and um, you know, that was almost verbatim the way John Myers said it That's last why, time. Because yeah. somebody sold it to him the same way. Well, and, at, the, at the end of in-country training. Right. The little guy, because we're looking for volunteers, and McIntyre goes for a while. We can't say, either you're in or you're out. And 
it should be like you got you know that's like man that you guys are completely <laughs> uh, nutballs and you're <laughs> that's, that's a prerequisite. But, no, but the you reality be is off. though is <laughs> all my friends in fifth group. I'm not saying not all Green Berets are that way. Not all, but the majority <laughs> of Green Berets, they're and my wife will back me up on this shit as they word it. You guys are not wired right. You're just not wired They're right. doers. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> yes. They don't run from think, the sound of guns. No, think they outside, don't. Think um, outside the box. <laughs> yeah, my wife, uh, and we, we talk about, like, we talk about, and you've, you used to teach out at gun site. Oh, Absolutely, yes. No, um, not for many years. Okay, but, um, you know, we talk about sheepdogs, and people talk about, uh, we're big on taking... Cap uh, concerned citizens turning them into capable citizens, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we tell people you know if there's ever the active shooter at the mall or something, you're responsible to get your family to safety. You're not responsible to save the day. But my wife, you look at all the money that the government spent on me, hostage rescue schools, this, that, and the other. Um, my wife knows if there's ever gunfire at the mall, she knows I'm getting her to the nearest exit. And she knows I'm not going with her. And I'm not saying all our viewers have to be that way. I, again, I want to remind you, um, your family is all you're responsible for. That's it. Now understand that law enforcement officers, bless, bless them. You know I support the guys in blue. But they carry a gun to protect themselves. Uh, they get there as fast as they can, but 99% of the time they get there to do the paperwork afterwards. You guys Amen. are the one responsible. So, um, well, it's good to see I'm not the only one wired like this. So that that's yeah. awesome. You got you guys are my heroes. Uh, literally, me being a little E5 in my little hide site with my my little recon team, my little scout team. You guys, you guys, my hero. So this is so awesome. This well, look, let me let me just backtrack for uh, your first question about where can they go. If they just go to my website, Sog Chronicles. Uh, the first four episodes from Sogcast are posted there, and okay. in the next few weeks, when the next batch come out, they'll all be on my website. Awesome. But now that we're here with John, the key thing here is that people that haven't read the books yet, three years in Sog, starts out running recon, and Something I never did, which is among many things, his recon team actually captured POW. And they worked with Dick Meadows. And they ran out of CCC, FOB2, yep. and Contum. In 68, we had six FOBs. They were consolidated to CCN, CCC Central, CCS. So John then comes back for another tour of duty, runs recon, then gets involved flying Covey, which is our FAC. Yeah, the forward air control and, and aircraft. SOG, the Covey rider is the man who talks to the team on the ground. Yeah. It can't be a rookie. It can't be an Air Force mm -hmm. guy. In our day, it had to be somebody like John. Yeah. So not only do we have a legend from being on the ground, running recon, bringing back a live POW, which I never did. We didn't even get close like he did. And then on top of that, as a Covey rider, there's times in his book, there are men that say they're alive today thanks to him because they're in the middle of a world of shit and John says, you got to calm down so I can hear you. Yeah. I have to talk to you to help direct the airstrikes to save your ass. And he did it. And this is part of these books. This is the history. Some more of his stories there that are actual, factual. And he's researched this stuff for over 10 years before he got to writing these books. And so that's why we're dealing with the godfather the of God Godfather writers. of uh, Mac Vista. And we're not even talking about the pictorial yet. He did a pictorial book, yes, the which homage, includes a picture of, of the spot. Homage, these guys, they do this uh, to John, and then to watch him go, holy smokes, we actually have John Plaster oh, on the show. It. That is so cool. It's I, so I cool. was going to say, one of the, I was always proud, very proud of the saves. Yeah. Because uh, that's, I did not want to fly Cubby until I'd been running recon for two years. And I was convinced that all that experience I had could best serve the rest of us yeah. by being in that airplane awesome. and supporting the teams on the Without ground. Without a doubt. Now, I put in so many airstrikes, I don't even know, hundreds and hundreds of them in support of teams. That is just and that brought is our, just awesome. helped keep our guys alive on the ground. One of the guys that we, by the sake of God, ran into, he wasn't even one of our own teams, it was a CCN team, was Eldon Bargewell. <laughs> 
Okay. Did you know that? We no. knew him as a spec okay. four. Really? And later, he retired oh, as a two-star general. As a two-star general, <laughs> but he was an E6 at this time. At that time, he was an E6. Right. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> and he was inside the border of South Vietnam, but I'm out with a uh, in an OV-10, which is an armed Bronco, reconnaissance right? an OV-10 yeah. Bronco, right yeah. in the back seat. And we had rocket pods with HE, high yeah. explosive, yeah. and we had four M60 machine guns. <laughs> now, you weren't going to win the war with that, but you yeah. could buy time oh, yeah. until the fighters yeah. got yeah. there. But anyways, we had no teams on the ground. The weather is bad in our AO. So being curious about geography, <laughs> we decided to go see what the rest of Vietnam looked like. <laughs> We just went sightseeing. <laughs> we went sightseeing. That is just. But so it was along badass. the ocean border. It's along the ocean border. We got up to Cam Duck Special Forces Camp, which had been overrun in '68. Yeah. And yeah. it pissed me off. I looked down there. There were fresh truck tracks. The NVA had the audacity to be running trucks all the way in to Cam Duck, and to prevent the uh, airfield from being used, they had three big pyramids of 55-gallon drums on the airfield, so no fixed wing. So nobody could land. Emergency, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, sometimes yeah. it, it get an aircraft damaged, yeah. they'll, they'll yeah. land in- Anywhere you can find a place, you can. yeah. But anyway, so as we're flying along, that day, an F-4 was missing, an RF-4, a Recce mm -hmm. Bird, yeah. that had been across the border and then along the border. He should have been back by now, so all, the word was all out. Listen for story. I still remember. I'll always remember it. Stormy 03 was his call sign. Stormy 03. Stormy 03. We're flying along the border and we hear beep, 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 That's emergency radio. Beacon. 240. That's a beacon. Or beacon. Anyway, so we go to it because the pilot up front, he can lock into the direction. Yeah, directions. We fly to it. And on guard, I'm telling him, come up voice, come up voice. It wasn't Stormy 03. It was Bargewell's recon team. Oh, we didn't even know they're on the ground because they're outside our yeah, yeah, yeah. the CCN. Yeah. And there was nobody else in that area that could have heard them. So we went over to them. Already, Bargewell, he had an RPG machine gun. We sawed him off. Yeah. And he blasted a <laughs> bunch of bad guys. But he took, I think, two AK rounds. Of one in the face. One in the face. And uh, there, those guys are fighting for their yeah. lives. Oh, He's yeah. badly yeah. wounded. And if not for the grace of God of the unfortunate loss of Stormy 03, we you wouldn't have been there. been there. And fortunately, we had an OV-10. Yeah. So we were able to just turn right in and start blasting. And think about nowadays, if you want to go into an AO outside your own and help oh, yeah, somebody yeah. use contact. Higher command would lose their mind. I know, People but we just... in rank. Oh, there were yeah. guys, we didn't even know for sure it was a CCN team. We just knew they were, it was an American yeah. boys. Yeah. So we put in uh, uh, our own rockets and such around them. And we're talking to them on guard. And a Huey crew calls in. Says, oh, Roger, uh, do you need some help? <laughs> As a matter of fact, yeah, yes, we, we did. did. So a random first. Now this is again. I talk about divine intervention all the time. I'm a I'm a big believer. You, you just you've been overseas. You've seen too much silly shit. I know you guys agree with me. The odds of you guys being bored <laughs> and just and no teams on the ground, yeah, so we no can go in our We're bored. We're bored. We're gonna go sightseeing, and then the odds of a just random Huey just showing up. It actually turned out to be a flight of four. A flight of four. That... And as quickly as he called in, because you're all yep. talking on yeah, guard, yeah. all the aircraft monitor guard. So here comes a pair of Cobra gunships. Nice. Say, Roger, <laughs> you need some... I forget, we were like Cubby 577 or something. Cubby 577, yep. could you use us? We're a flight of two Alpha Hotel yep. Ones. Yeah, as come join the party. Yes, we can. Come <laughs> So, by complete improvisation, without any possible plan, and we had no authority to be calling no, yeah, areas, so we just did area. it, and right. they didn't give a damn. They came out anyhow. Yeah. We put in the, the gunships around them, and then by by luck, another OB-10 showed up, and it was flying for CCN. Yeah. So we were just getting the choppers in to pick them up. And turn the ball game over. We call that kind of situation. Yep. Ball game. Appropriate, you know, you don't 
you know, push noses into each other's oh, faces. Yeah, yeah, of course. Their lives on yeah. the dark. Said, yeah. you want it? You got it? You got it. Yeah. We backed away. But I did not even know that was part well wow. for about 30 years. No. Really? And then all of a sudden, you guys probably sitting somewhere getting liquored up. Well, actually, uh, it was one of the sure. guys on his team that put it together. That is awesome. That is awesome. Small world. Small it's, world. It's just amazing. And you know, there, there's some Huey pilot. Hell, he might be the Huey pilot. Those guys should have had decorations. I, to this day, I yeah. don't know who they were. <laughs> It was and like it somebody coming down the highway and stopping with in October. We got a couple uh, old Nam uh, Huey pilots that are going to be flying <clears> down <throat> at uh, Round Canopy Parachute Team in Palatka. We're, we're going. I'm taking my son jumping again. We talked about it earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you just never know. You never know, guys. You never know that guy walking around with the old Fifth Group hat. You just <laughs> never know what you're getting into. Uh, that is so cool. Tell. Uh, not meaning to bring up old um, traumatic uh, thoughts and all. Bringing up, uh, capturing uh, a live enemy soldier, a uh, prisoner, like Tilt said, that's it's it's not oh, like yeah. it is in the it's movies. Very hard, where, very dangerous. Not like it is in the movies where yeah. you, they right. just snatch everybody. Um, you, you want you want to talk us sure, through that? Sure. In early 1970, okay, intelligence, other kinds of intelligence, wire, excuse me, uh, radio intercepts, whatever, aerial mm -hmm. photography, determined there were a lot of loads of supplies, i.e. ammunition, and troops mm -hmm. massing adjacent to the uh, central highlands of South Vietnam. They were across the border in northern Cambodia mm -hmm. and southern Laos. The commander of SOG, Colonel uh, Kavanaugh, was in a meeting at MACV headquarters, and General Abrams, who was then the commander, and this sounds, this is really true, like this oh, yeah, really yeah. happened at okay. that level, said, hey, what can SOG do to try to tell us what's going on, what, what's in these convoys, and where are they massing them? Well, we just have a general idea. Kavanaugh decided the best thing, he's Chief SOG, he decided the best thing was probably to bring back a prisoner. And, you know, it's one thing to say, bring me back a colonel. How the hell do you do that? <laughs> but Kavanaugh was pretty darn shrewd. He was an old World War II paratrooper, yeah. and he'd, he'd been special forces for many years. He figured out that knowing how the NVA operated their convoys, the lead driver of a convoy is a guy who knows where they're coming from and knows where they're going and knows what they're carrying. All you have to do is ambush a North Vietnamese convoy at night <laughs> on Highway 110 <laughs> East in southern Laos, and, and you'll know. Just stop the lead vehicle that's got all the vehicles behind, behind it, it. With, their, right. with their guns pointed forward. Yep. Nah, indeed. nobody's going to see that. This is easy. This is going to be easy. How do you even... <laughs> well, anyhow, it, it was it called... better. It was called Ashtray One, and... <laughs> We had a major who was, was quite quite an accomplished guy, Frank Jacks, who had originally been with the Czech resistance fighting the Nazis in World War II as a teenager. And he was on his second or third tour in Vietnam, the second tour in SOG. Well, he was placed in command of Operation Ash Tree One, and they got together selecting among the best one zeros or, or just playing rock SOG guys mm -hmm. out of Command and Control Central. And he assembled his team. They were given a week or two to train, figure out how they would ambush a truck to stop it, how they'd get that truck driver and stop the rest of the convoy and so on. Well, they went out. They trained for that. This is amazing. They actually let them blow up a perfectly good two-and-a-half-ton truck <laughs> in training. It's a worthy cause, okay? Of course, of, of course. course. But <laughs> they inserted, and they were just coming out when I came back from extension leave. They had indeed ambushed a truck, but there was such a hell of a fight afterward that they accidentally killed a driver. <laughs> well, I can't say accidentally. They wanted to, but it was unintentional. Yeah. But all of a sudden, you know, they're getting all this fire. They've got yeah, to turn you, it. You've got to haul off. We can't take him with and us. He's I, slowing us down. And yeah. I think one of their guys was wounded. But anyways, they came out alive. Mm -hmm. Well, that night in the club, I went up to Jackson, told him, sir, 
And well, he was telling about the mission. Mm -hmm. and he said, next time, I'm going to go back, I'm going to do it again. And if we take any wounded, anybody sick, we're going to cache them and continue to march. I was not drunk. That's important for this story. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. said, I'll go with you. I said, I volunteer right now. Because it's the kind of thing, the greatest achievement, you're going to ambush a convoy, destroy some trucks, and you're going to get a prisoner. Those are two of the greatest things you oh, can yeah, do. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. So about a week later, um, I'm walking across the compound, and the guy tells me, hey, Major Jax wants to see you. So I went into his office, and he had this captain there, Fred Krupa. <laughs> and uh, he's another recon team leader, but he's fairly green. He was a good guy. He'd been in the uh, first calf at a previous tour, but he didn't know that much about running recon. Mm -hmm. So uh, Frank Jack said, Sergeant Plaster, you and Captain Krupa are going to be Operation Ash Tree 2. I mean, I went, what? <laughs> And it had to do a lot with a previous mission I'd run where we'd been in a Mexican standoff with a bunch of NBA and I kept a really cool head. Everybody could have got wiped out both sides, but when we managed to, to get out of it and then call it an airstrike. Anyhow, he thought, that's why. Because he knew that I wasn't an idiot. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, uh, we succeeded in that previous mission. And it's easy for people to say, well, you know, I would do the right thing. Uh, but the reality is I have seen lantern-jawed, muscle-bound Green Berets that just, uh, at that moment of truth, they just didn't have it. And uh, you just never know till you're actually under fire. See, he knew it would and, have been so easy to open fire, yeah. and that was a natural thing instinctively. Yeah. I wanted to do, but I wouldn't let anybody. Yeah. And the NBA saw us, yeah. but they didn't want to die that day, and they had more of them yeah. than us. So we backed away and called an airstrike on them. <laughs> But, awesome. but he right. knew about that mission. I remember he stopped me in the hall that day after I debriefed, and he said, that's really amazing. So we're, I'm in there with Krupa, and he said, you're going to take the Americans from both your teams to make a single team. Sergeant Plaster, Staff Sergeant Plaster, you're in charge. <laughs> and, and you're going to be running this mission with Captain Krupa. And Sog, Sog was one of these wonderful places where pure merit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your rank didn't matter a bit. Yeah, we had no, E5s leading with captains yeah, and so yeah. on. Who had experience? Like Joe Walker said one time, ah, a guy with 10 missions doesn't know 10 times as much as a guy with one. He knows a thousand times as much. Because yeah. it's just it's so dangerous. And you're experiencing mm -hmm. these things and figuring out ways to accomplish your mission without getting wiped mm -hmm. out. Yeah. So and we trained. Would. They would just disappear. Some teams. We had. Like, yeah. We lost uh, uh, yeah. fourteen teams. Yeah. Complete. Mm -hmm. But uh, but anyway, so we trained hard. We had to figure out how we we're going to stop this truck. It, you know, we tried practice dropping trees. Yeah. You know, using a base charge and a, and a yeah, kick kicker charge, on yeah. the top. Yeah, but that's too slow, yeah. and it's not dramatic enough. I mean, you got It's like sucker punching. You yes. got to hit them hard. <laughs> so finally, we came up with something that John Baker had done on the previous mission. He was a demo guy. He took claymores and linked them together with debt cord, but focused in a single spot on the road. Mm -hmm. And that was intended to destroy the front tire okay. of, a, of an NVA truck, which it would probably collapse it. Yeah. And then it halts in your kill, would be kill zone or yeah. Yeah. ambush. So uh, we practiced that, and we drilled day and night, and after about a week of really hardcore training, we were ready. <clears throat> so we went in, first two nights, we were about five clicks, five kilometers south of the highway. You always wanted to go in for a mission like that with at least one major terrain feature between you and the road system. Mm -hmm. NVA security was concentrated along the road system. Yeah. You went in one hillside away or yeah. mountainside, yeah. and they wouldn't blatantly see you come in. Yeah. Maybe. 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 Which is how we went in. And so, you know, we've been creeping and sneaking. And Sneaky first Pete's. night in. Sneaky Pete's. Yeah. <laughs> first night in, 
we're in our little RON, rest overnight, we're all yeah. asshole to yeah. asshole, yeah. tight. Yeah. And uh, about 10 o'clock, off in the distance, we hear trucks, truck engines going by. Nobody said a word, but I looked around, we were all sitting up because we knew tomorrow's the day. We're close enough to hear the trucks. We're close enough to get there tomorrow. Showtime. Showtime. <laughs> so we, uh, next day, we went through a, a, an abandoned enemy base camp. Those guys are really must have loved to dig because they dug so neatly. I mean, it was like the corners of what they dug was 90 degrees. Nice. <laughs> but anyway, so we went through this abandoned base camp. But you see, their, their system was you build it real nice today. Because six months from now, you might want, you come want back, to come yeah. back. Need it, yeah. You need it. So anyway, so we made it through there. We crossed a little stream. And long, a little before noon, we reached Highway 110. And it was so dangerous at that point that only Krupa and I crept forward and left the team 100 meters back in the jungle. Looking at the spot where we were, it was thin bamboo. Not very good cover at all. Mm -hmm. But And we were slightly downhill. I looked at it, Cooper's ready to say, well, <coughs> this is a spot that's good for an ambush. And I said, exactly. The North Vietnamese are not going to expect an ambush along this stretch. They are not going to position anyone here, or as they often did, yeah. sweep through before dark with a platoon to see if there are any ambushes out there. Mm -hmm. Remember, the North Vietnamese stationed 60,000 soldiers in Laos, along the Ho Chi Minh Trail yeah. security. And some of those guys are anti-aircraft gunners, but there were battalions out there that wanted nothing more than to bump into some of yeah. us. And so, they're always clearing suspected ambush sites. Right, Yeah. right. Yeah. So we got up there, and at absolute last light, I moved up, the other guys were gonna be part of the ambush position. Security, right and left, about 100 meters down the road each way. <clears throat> And now it was, excuse me, I didn't even mention this, but prior to it being dark, which kind of pissed me off, we had two trucks drive by. <laughs> now they weren't supposed to be doing that, you know? In the daylight. Suppo in daylight. I mean, how dare you? <laughs> oh, where's Cubby? Where's an AC-130 or something? <laughs> oh, I actually looked, there was one of these guys smiling, kind of singing a song, one of the drivers. <laughs> He didn't, he, know he, he didn't know how, how lucky he, he was. was. He was saying, I love Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> yeah, I love Ho Chi Anyway, so those two went by, but didn't want to call or didn't want to, to launch it. We weren't set up yeah. with the claymores. Once you put those claymores out, they have to be actually on the edge of the road. Yeah. Uh, you'd be spotted if anybody by foot. Yeah. On foot came yeah, by. Yeah, they came by. I mean, you can only camouflage Claymore so well. Oh, yeah. and we, yeah. we're going to use darkness to camouflage yeah. ours. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, so it, those two trucks had come by. And now it was absolutely last light. I went out, I picked a tree across the road, which is how we figured out how to do yeah. it. And that was going to be my aiming point. Because when the tires on the truck aligned, that's when I was going to... Yeah. I was, as a, when you're the leader, you are the one who initiates the ambush. Okay. You don't with a, do it with a signal shot or a whistle or something. You claymore. do it with act, some kind of offensive action. Yeah. It could be shooting, it could be a claymore. But that way, there's no doubt about it, and there's no time gap between initiating yeah. it, blow the whistle. <laughs> Was that the whistle? No. You, yeah. So I'm laying there beside the road, and we are... The Army says it should be at least 50 feet or 50 meters, probably, probably 50 feet yeah. for a Claymore. You should be no closer yeah. than that. That's oh, yeah, yeah. close. Yep. We were 15 feet away. <laughs> but we put it, basically, the three Claymores on the other side of a tree, yeah. which we often did in our yeah. ONs yeah. at night. Yeah. So the tree would sort of back yeah. blast. And <clears throat> we were down kind of low, mm -hmm. so we dropped down. Way off in the distance, you can hear it coming. This is the truck. And it was like probably took forever action, maybe three minutes. And finally, it rounded a corner a couple hundred meters down. How many trucks were there? Just Initially, one, just one, one. One truck, okay. Well, they space them out. Oh, okay. Because they don't want... AC-130. AC-130s to, yeah. to blow no, along. That makes total sense. And yeah. they were trained that if, if they heard an aircraft or got a signal shot, 
they were they had lots of camouflage on the top, just heaps yeah. of leaves. And they were in fact they also had like ours, our truck had uh, bamboo lattice work over the hood yeah. to con to prevent any glare off the uh, windshield. Okay. So they had yeah. camouflage all the way from here oh, to the tail. Yeah. Okay. It was a big moving bush. Yeah. But they were instructed that if they heard a signal shot or aircraft, they were just supposed to pull the side of the road and stop. And they wanted to keep their distance, just like American convoys. Yeah. You just want 100 meters yeah. between vehicles. Mm -hmm. Well, they were smart enough. They'd been hurt bad enough before that that they were wisely yeah. not ganging up. So finally this thing comes. It's got the uh, blackout light, little cat's eye light shining yep. on the road. Yeah. It's coming, 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 coming. Finally, that gets in front of that tree. Boom! <laughs> and the one thing I regret is that I forgot to close both my eyes. <laughs> oh, it, at night, the, the blast, you got blast. this tremendous flash. I, you know, I wouldn't even have thought of that. Oh. No, you know, I about taught that like 20 times, close one eye. I would have forgot for well, sure. Fortunately, I was in the process of closing them both. So my left eye was good and my right eye was just black. Yeah. So I was going to have to shoot my car 15 using my left eye. <laughs> so as per plan, I jumped up to run around the side, to the reverse side where the uh, assistant driver would be. Because yeah. we were told they were usually armed. Yeah. And without any hesitation, I was going to take them out if I saw a weapon. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd oh, boat us, two, two prisoners. Chu hoi. Chu hoi, chu hoi. Yeah. And meanwhile, <laughs> surrender. Um, yeah. John um, Yancey. Who was the huskiest guy? He was about like you, very solid guy. Okay. He later went into a Delta Force. He was one of the early guys. He was at Desert One. All right. But uh, John had only a nine millimeter Browning and bolt cutters in case this guy was chained to the steering wheel. We'd had some intel reports that said at uh, times the North Vietnamese chained him to the steering wheel, so during an airstrike they could not abort, uh, abandon their trucks. So anyways, okay. here he comes. He's like a ninja yeah. knight commando with his uh, bolt, bolt cutters. cutters strung over his back. Well, the guy wasn't bolted in. John just grabbed him like a, you know, I don't like a wet dishcloth. Boom! Pulled him up, <laughs> threw him on the ground, and shoved that browning high power inside of his head. And this is probably all the English that guy knew. No die. No die. No die. <laughs> no, no die. die. No <laughs> die. <laughs> so meanwhile, Fred Krupa was there. He had been covering from the other side. He, he was there and he was putting plastic uh, restraints on him. Flex cuffs, yeah. Yeah, because those yeah. damn cuffs, I used to carry the regular cuffs. They weigh about two pounds. Oh, yeah. They're heavy. They're heavy. Pounds yeah. equal pain. Yeah, yep. yeah, and I mean, I'd rather carry hand grenades yeah. than hand cuffs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so John, uh, uh, yeah, John Yancey has him down. <laughs> They're done. Woody, Richard Woody, who was also on the assault team. We had four guys on the assault team. Well, he was covering the back of the truck. So I shouted, withdraw, withdraw, loud enough. The teams, yeah. the, the other elements, security elements should have heard it. But just as a backup, we also trained that Woody would then blow on the whistle twice. A whistle he carried. He blows a second time and an AK hits him. Boom, boom. And he takes a round through each forearm. Not only is it a wound, but it broke both his forearms. He's, he's no. that close to me. And go boom, boom. So I jerk him over and behind cover of the truck. And there is, what the fuck are you going to do? you got to get out of there, quick. Yeah, yeah, and I these mean. are under NVA reacting <laughs> to the sound of the ambush. So I took him. If, I mean, if no. you may be my training aid. <laughs> Indeed. Training okay, aid. he's wearing a jungle shirt. Yeah. So I unbuttoned a couple uh, buttons, and I shoved this one in like this, and that one in like that, and buttoned them up so they had, I mean, I'd never thought about it before, but you had to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, the arms were useless. Yeah. His arms were useless, yeah. and it was to, to try at least to limit some of the bleeding. Yeah. So Rex Jaco, also on the team, but he was in charge of security on our left foot. <laughs> he, he's there. He takes uh, Woody with him and now 
all the security is pulled out, and we got a wounded, seriously wounded man yeah. heading back to our rally point, which is where the radio operator is, 100 meters into the jungle. And it's really dark out. So I decided to stay at the truck. You had to buy time. Oh, yeah. So I started a little exchanging fire with some enemy. Yeah. Um, one of them apparently threw a grenade that detonated. And I got one tiny piece of shrapnel. In my, well, I might have got two. I'm not sure. How, but one you, small how piece. can you not be sure? You well, got because it's ne I think it's working its way out. But, <laughs> but anyway, so this was, that was my huge war wound. Adrenaline. <laughs> Exactly, it was uh, a drill. And anyway, it's, so... It's just a flesh wound. It's yeah. just a flesh wound. The, the, <laughs> is a, a great danger at that point is I'd equipped each American with a uh, Claymore bag containing time delay grenades. You take just a regular high HE yep. fragmentation grenade, you get rid of the normal fuse, yep. and you put in a non-electric cap, yep. and you kind of wedge it so it's not shaking around yeah. in there. You'd rather not meet your maker too yeah. early. And then cut time time cord to a certain Whatever time length. Whatever you wanted it, yeah. And I had arranged, I was actually kind of scientific. I was sitting in the club drinking and writing down the intervals at which I wanted the stuff to go off. Yeah. HE grenades, white phosphorus grenades, and CS grenades. Nice. Shake them back. Shake them yeah. back. And, nice. and as they were pulling back, they weren't supposed to be doing anything but moving out. But they get into that Claymore bag, pull the pin, throw one that way, throw another one, <laughs> throw another one. And the first one had like a minute and 30 seconds. And then the next one had, I don't know, two minutes, four minutes. I think the longest one was 12. So that from the North Vietnamese perspective, they're, they're now ready to go in the jungle after yeah. these night commandos. Yeah. And they go short just and boom! And I tell you, an HE grenade is a powerful thing. It's Very much more so. powerful yeah. than in the movies. Oh, yeah. Particularly in the middle yeah. of the night. In the middle of the night, oh, yeah, the yeah. flash effect. Yeah. So you just know they'd return fire, and they did. And they'd drop down and wait. And then they'd wait. That's what I figured out on the napkin in the bar. <laughs> and they'd wait. Nothing would happen. They'd get up, start moving again. Boom! Another about, one would go off. About the next time they build up their courage. Right. And after the second one, it takes even longer to build up your courage. Ah, you boys. So we had we figured this yeah. out. We had we had to have something to help break contact and hinder the pursuit. Yeah. But as well, um, now there's some North Vietnamese. This is before that stuff got, started going off. Mm -hmm. And as I disappeared into the jungle, there were some North Vietnamese using the truck for cover and firing aimlessly yeah. into the jungle. Yeah. And uh, I had placed, in fact, you've seen the photograph, I had placed a thermite grenade <laughs> on the hood so it would burn through, it's 2,000 degrees yeah, Fahrenheit, yeah, yeah. Yep. it'll burn through the metal and then burn the engine block so it can't be mm -hmm. used again. Yep. And just for an extra effect, I threw a satchel charge and tried inside. They were never going to use that truck again. <laughs> so off we went into satchel the Satchel charge has got how many pounds of oh, uh, I had, explosive I, in I it? I forget, like two, three pounds of... Uh, no, the single stick was two pounds. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, I probably had six pounds. Oh, yeah. Because I didn't want to try that truck again. <laughs> yeah. I carried that throughout the mission just, just for that. <laughs> So anyways, so they're kind of shooting back, and I'm about halfway back to the rally point. Oh, boom! And up <laughs> it went, and all fire ceased. You shouldn't laugh about that kind of thing, because there's some souls now with their ancestors. No, you don't but, understand. you got to laugh. They give me shit. Those, the monkeys, especially, yeah, the ones, especially the ones in the back. Because I tell them... Um, Combat is, it's 30 days of boredom for 30 seconds of excitement, but it's hilarious. As much as people uh, want to say it's tragic, and I understand it's tragic, of course. but a lot of times, the, them getting right up to the truck right when your satchel charge cooked off, oh. it's that, just... That, when, <laughs> when it, eventually, I was flown down to Saigon with the prisoner <laughs> on one of our C-130s. Yeah. Because this is the first time we'd ever done that before. Yeah. Ambushed the convoy, it grabbed the yeah. driver and brought him back. So they set a C-130 to pick us up. We flew down to Saigon, and that night I briefed back the mission to General Abrams and the other honchos, yeah. 
two or three four-star generals. And what's funny is I was explaining step by step what had happened. And I explained how I, I was now about halfway back to the uh, rally point. And then the, de the demo went off, the satchel charge, and all enemy fire ceased. Like two, three of the generals went, ha, 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 ha. I swear, I swear. <laughs> because it's funny. It's, <laughs> well, like it's awesome. It's not our guys. Not they do that exactly. to our guys in a heart. Exactly. That's what you have to realize about combat is you're, they're going to be out to kill you. Yes. And if you want so. victory, you're going to have to kill some of them, like yes. it or not. And, and, I, and I know our, our viewers get it, they, at least most of them, but a, a lot of your um, diehard hippie liberals and everything, they just, well, it's tragic, you shouldn't be making fun of the loss of life and everything, but uh, you guys were not going out to rape, pillage, and destroy people, and you weren't serial killers, and you, you weren't There were robbing. no babies in our exactly. AO. Exactly. There were no exactly. little native villages. No. It was all occupied no. guys, by the North Vietnamese. Yes. It was a field army Very much there. so, very much so. And, I, and um, on behalf of a grateful nation, I apologize for all the monkeys, the generation ahead of me, where you guys came home to such a shitty homecoming. You know, you guys getting accused of everything, and that... It, to this day still bothers me but when I came home just for even Desert Storm the Vietnam vets were just you guys were just lined up to welcome us back and, and we stuck up for you exactly time and exactly. again when the media just start to kind of hint about war crimes or yeah. killing babies or something they didn't realize that all us old guys were now business exec executives people in the yeah. media yada yada mm -hmm. they couldn't get away with it again yeah yeah uh, so well, it gave me immense pleasure. I'm sure it's oh, yeah. for you as well, John, to see the kind of, of homecoming. The vets at Desert Storm. Yeah. At, well, wah, wah. That's yeah. life. That's gone. But you guys got what you I, I, should I, have got. I, I appreciate it. I'm sorry you guys didn't get it. But I'm, I'm glad you guys got were at least part of it, giving it back to us. So... Um, Man, yeah, we, it, we didn't go into it for We just came home, went back to work. Yeah. And, and, he, and he stayed in for tw 23 years. 23 years. Yeah. 23 11 years. active and uh, yeah. 12 reserve components. But what I, what I really felt sorry for, now I, I came home, you know, they, they, I actually once had a woman I'm in uniform call me a baby killer. Yeah. Get out of it. We were professional soldiers. Exactly. In, in special forces. Mm -hmm. But... There were all these draftees. They would. They didn't volunteer for anything. Exactly. They were taken out of their lives, yeah. put through training, and sent to Vietnam mm -hmm. to see those guys treated like dirt. That set me up the yeah. wall. Mm -hmm. I, I have a I have a patron, uh, Dean D'Alessandro. Dean, if you're watching, you know I love you. He's one of my uncles um, from Chicago. That's what he was. And Dean is very passionate about supporting you guys, but also supporting us because he literally was a draftee. He went to basic training and it was super short and basically he was showed how to move the M16 from safe two clicks over to full auto. And literally that was the extent of his tactics. Really? I'll literally, tell you, it was a your, crime. Yeah, it was it a crime. It was, it really was. And the Marines had even yeah. less training than the Army. Yeah. No, really? Oh yeah, they could come off the they could come off the block, drafted and be in Vietnam six months later. Mm. It was some of that stuff, and and we would be like at an airstrip waiting to go in, yeah. and here would come an American unit by. I remember watching these Fourth Division soldiers came off C 130s and they were they were going to climb on Hughes yeah. to insert in your dock toe. They were loaded down with C rations. Cases of mortar ammunition. They look like pack horses. Yeah. How the hell do you slip around in the jungle and take on an enemy? And they're going to know exactly where you are yeah. all the time. Yeah. They're going to decide whether or not to initiate contact. And when they do, what to do or avoid contact. Mm -hmm. All the initiatives on their side. Yeah. Stupidity, stupidity. Mm. Did that, you see that kind of thing? Nothing, nothing that dramatic, but it makes too much sense. It's just sad. Yeah.
All right, so you two never served each other. How, how many years apart? Who was over there first, one or the other? Well, I got there in May of 68. Oh, okay, I got there in uh, December of 68. Yeah. So, so well, I, I was up north, though. CCS. Well, remember, That's right. You're a... I was originally at CCS. <laughs> All right, so you guys overlapped. You were in different parts of the country running the border, but you never knew each other when you were over Well, there. in 68, there were six FOBs. So I was up at FOB1 up north, yeah. and then you were at Da Nang. FOB four, right, and then he was there for a short while, and then went down to FOB two, which is Contum, which is two core, and it's FOB adjacent to the tri border. Okay. Yeah, you were and DMZ and Chipotle. DMZ, you write all that. Uh, Ashon Valley up in that. Yeah, area. MA and targets. So when did you guys finally meet after the war? Like probably at an SOA convention. That or or the uh, well, we talked on the phone a lot because we were working yes. talking about the books. Yes, we talked a lot. <laughs> and then we finally met. It may have been at the one the, the SFA convention in Vegas. Yeah. No, SOA. It was the SOA? What's S-O-A? SOA? Special Operations Association. Association. Never heard of it. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, I, I have <laughs> the top secret the term, elite, but you have to have actually served in some kind of classified wartime okay. operation. We've got a few guys still around there, OSS from World War II. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say, the OSS guy. Well, yeah, uh, including Jack Singlob, who just turned 100 on July 10th. He was Chief SOG for two years. I'd be happy to make 60. Yeah. Plus, yeah. I was happy to make 23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> <laughs> but Singlob was both Chief SOG and he had parachuted with a team into France. Behind the German yeah. lines. And then they to parachuted work with into the French China. Maquis. And he parachuted into China. Oh, Manchuria. Yeah. Well, that's part of China yeah. today. The Chinese Indeed. will argue with you about that. Indeed. <laughs> but that was because there was fear that the Japanese were going to start killing prisoners, which mm-hmm. they had done before. Mm-hmm. So he was parachuted right into a POW camp <laughs> to take their surrender. So they were. He not, he's bluffed, a one man army. <laughs> he bluffed the Japanese. They, they, he, they thought he had more manpower than what he had. <laughs> yep. And he was able to you save can't. over, over 100 the, POWs. You can't even make that shit up. So, no. You know. It's gall. It's I'll tell you what, spot. I'll, I'll parachute in. Yeah. Hold my beer, and I'll just walk in and say I ex- accept your surrender. And some picture. officer actually said, "Sure, go ahead." And, and I think it's his book, <laughs> "Hazardous Duty," is a picture of him with his back turned to a Japanese lieutenant because he refused to talk to him. I want to talk to your base commander. And there's a picture of him with his back turned to the lieutenant. <laughs> yeah, you know, face. Asian oh, yeah. face, yeah. He was oh, he was playing the game. That's awesome. Yeah. And it'd say what a study was in Vietnam we had Skyhook. Yeah. Which was the C one thirty would come by and the balloon would go up and there'd be a metal cable down to a person on the ground yeah. in a suit. In the suit, yeah. So uh, when he was Chief Sog, they came up with this for an extraction for POWs or um, down pilots. Yeah. Jack goes, Nobody's gonna do this till I do it. He's in his fifties then. And if you guys it, don't know what Skyhook is, one, you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, there's lots of little videos of it. But they actually used it in the movie The Green Berets. And James Bond. Yeah, and James Bond. Bond. Yeah. Um, yeah. The one with the nuke. Thunderball. Yeah. Thunderball. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and you're believe it or not, ground. the plane they used was one of the real test aircraft from an outfit. I think it was CIA <laughs> cover. Is that out, right? of, out of Montana. <laughs> but but that oh. was one of the real yeah. initial Skyhook aircraft. And so and the, 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 the capper to the story is he told the Air Force guys, when you pick me up, take me over to China Sea, and, and then there's a retractor that brings the individual yeah, yeah, into the yeah. plane. They forgot. They went over the land, and he was getting shot at by the Viet Cong. <laughs> While they're trying to pull yeah. him in. <laughs> they were doing target practice. And at that time, he was, uh, what, a light colonel? No, colonel. Full colonel. Full yeah. colonel at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and he did spec ops in the Korean War, OSS World War II, and in both theaters. During the Chinese yeah. War, the Chinese yeah. Civil War, oh, yeah, when the yeah, communists yeah. were fighting uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, yeah. he was in Singapore. Yeah, I think he was agency at that That's point. That's awesome. Uh, Loan to the agency. This is one of the, their guys, these guys' In heroes. the spare time. Uh, and then don't forget after that, we had Nicaragua and El Salvador we had the communist takeover down there. Mm-hmm. He would back, went out and raised billions of dollars to help fight the communists. And he didn't Central take America. a cut either. So he wouldn't or use it. any any yeah. deframement of expenses or anything. Unlike politicians today. Um, or like one marina took a little couple bucks. Yeah, we know who that is. 
I'm sorry, I didn't say that. He bought new tires for his car. That, that, yeah. All right, so, uh, we've got a couple uh, questions from our studio Already? audience here. Uh, first one is <clears throat> from 308 Nate. Great American war fighters, thank you guys for your service and sacrifices. We're all in debt to you. Hopefully the younger generation are inspired by your stories to become better Americans. Amen to that. You know, I can't say enough to both you guys. You know, thank you for your service. And... Uh, yeah, sincerely. Correct. One generation to stuff. another, right here. Absolutely. Yeah. You carry and the you're carrying the next generation. Yeah. I'm trying to train the next generation without a doubt. Yeah. Chad, can you pull us up the next one? We got one more? Yeah. What do we got? That wasn't a question. That was a statement. Yeah, it was yeah. a statement. I thought it was a question. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Right. It's Chad's we'll fault. We'll do it. We can. Chad's fault. That's a given. It, well, you already know. <laughs> Kevin Terrell, um, he's a local here. He uh, had a question about steel case ammo. He asked that at the very beginning. Okay, before we kicked all later. this off. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, I'll tell you what. Ke Kevin is actually, a, uh, he's a local guy here in town. He actually, uh, uh, great American, great local guy here, very involved with his local church and everything. Great guy. Kevin, I'll tell you what, brother. Um, come visit. Stop by your local, and Kevin will we'll stop by and visit without a doubt. We got a bunch of bunch of guys here. Wow, we have, we must have been talking for a while. We've done burnt up over an hour already. No, <laughs> yeah, we've done pissed away yeah. an hour. No, I've <laughs> got good hour. people here, um, but I I know I always get good questions. We're gonna try to get caught up on questions real quick, and then we're gonna hit up tilt on. Uh, we're gonna get one of his glorious stories. And we already did that one, Chad. Let's go to the next one. All right, I already did Kevin. Kevin, you know we love you, brother. Uh, this one is from Flint Lockie. Nothing. He just uh, did a donation. We appreciate it. Next one. Uh, this is from an anonymous donor named Jerry J. Can you sign a book for me, please, for Chuck Sog from Mac V Sog? That would be awesome. Uh, Jerry J. is he, he's actually working on his American <laughs> citizenship. He was a uh, former Czech Republic special ops guy. He was actually in the green zone uh, same time my A-team was working in Baghdad, working outside our city and stuff. He's now, I think Jerry's living in uh, Jersey or somewhere. Total not bad. We love you, Jerry, just not that much. He came down a parachute with us in uh, March in Florida. And, of course, like all former Soviet Union guys, he decides to show off. Tried to do a stand-up landing with one leg down, reaching for the ground. Sh just snapped that ow, big First jump in, like, 20 years. Oh. And nutbag decides he wants to do a stand-up landing. Yeah, uh, all the cool points. <laughs> As John adjusts his knee brace. Yeah. <laughs> There's a price to being a yeah, parachute. Yeah, your own book. You ain't getting yeah. mine, Jerry. All right. Uh, next one is from my uncle down in Texas, James Swain. Uh, James, I hope you and your blushing bride are doing great. His comment is, true table of badasses. Thank you from Southeast Texas. Thanks, James. James, one of my original patrons. Uh, he's a great, great guy. Next one is from uh, Vico Lepisto. Did either of the gentlemen ever meet Larry Thorne or Lori... Tammy, that was a Swedish, the or excuse me, Finnish name, right? Finnish, yeah. Uh, if so, any stories? He was KIA before we got there. Okay. He yep. died on the first SOG mission. Very first insertion. Really? Yeah. Very yeah. first but insertion. But supposedly, they did find his remains they did. a couple years ago. And he was buried with the with the King Bees at the Arlington. Yeah. Awesome. One, one of the rare cases where one of our soldiers was buried with all the people that were on the crew. Uh, they were on the first target, they were a chase, chase ship. Okay. And they were in bad weather, but the team got in, and they were turning around to come back. Something happened to the helicopter. It crashed. And he mm -hmm. was a true fighter of communism. He fought the communists with the Nazis. The... Well, he actually fought the Winter War yeah. originally. And, right, before World War II. And remember the Russians invaded in yeah, 1940 yeah. Yeah. because they wanted to protect <clears throat> what's now St. Petersburg, but that zone was Leningrad. Yeah. They wanted better protection for it, so they thought, what could be better than taking away part of Finland? Well, the Finns didn't see it that way. Yeah, I go yeah. figure. Who saw that coming? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> but they, they inflicted such heavy casualties that it was a negotiated settlement. And he was awarded the Mannerheim Cross, which is the highest decoration wow. in the military. They're a Congressional Medal of Honor. Wow. Oh, yeah. You guys have truly, I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely American icons for sure. Um, and, uh, but it's, yeah, just, just to meet some of these people. Next one is Daniel Barry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Urban Cowboy, 19 Delta. He must have been a cab scout back in the day. I saw a documentary on LERPs and part of the final exam before graduating was going on an actual LERP mission. They said sometimes the instructor or students would get wounded or killed. Did Sog Assel go to LERP school in Vietnam? You guys know anything about this? Of I'm course, Sog had its own school Sog system. Had its own school. Yeah. We had a halo school, we had agent training, et cetera. You had the, and you had, when you came in, you had an in country school, which is all the SF, yeah. and then the specialized training right. for SOG. Just for SOG okay. cross border. And they did. They ran live missions and they had casualties. Right. In they, school. I mean, yeah, you'd that, think, that, well, this is just for training, but they'd put them in War Zone C yeah. down near Saigon. And mm -hmm. there were a lot, there's been a lot of action in there. So it was uh, quite a training action. No, we had so. guys killed. Your final exam, uh, you may die. So uh, <laughs> yeah. that's where the train how you fight thing kind of started. Uh, and it's, Maybe it's a saying you and all you know. You guys know the. He's deal. the history. Uh, he can give you the honest answer. Uh, sweat and training, <laughs> so you don't bleed in combat. I Absolutely. believe in that. We're Absolutely. very big on uh, training hard. Trust me, we sweat our ass off this last weekend. We just did combat pistol carbine uh, three days down in uh, Dover, Tennessee, and we uh, we had a great class. You sleep half the day yesterday? Uh, no, I had company. Oh, I don't I get did. to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> I must be. I'm very jealous. Uh, All right, next what, what, one. What, let me add one thing. Yep. Uh, I ran 22 cross border ops, except for one. SF training phase one at Fort Bragg was tougher as far as being physically demanding. Nice. No, so I, that prepares No, you. it does. <laughs> and you know that actually comes up from time to time. A lot of people uh, will say, you know, hey, Carl, tell us, tell us more about combat. Tell us more about this. Tell us more about that. And they're like, hey, what was the hardest thing you ever did? And um, like I record, I do I call it story time with Carl, but uh, for my patrons, once a month I share a story with them. Some of them are combat ops, but the hardest ones, hardest missions, were always were always the training missions. And everybody's like, "No, seriously." And I'm like, "No, literally." When we would plan a, well, you know, a FMP full mission profile, basically the rehearsal before you go overseas, mm -hmm. uh, the warrant officer in charge of setting up the bad guys and the scenario and all the support. Any contingency, because you plan all the contingencies, down helicopter, down this, loss of camo, um, anything that could go wrong always went wrong in training. And it would just piss us off. Like, really? How did the plane get lost? You know, or how did, how, how did we all of a sudden get a flat tire? How did this happen? How did that happen? What and happened when the GPS goes? Yeah, exactly. You, can you <laughs> use a compass? But uh, it literally <sighs> made there, doing buddy. it made doing combat ops so much easier. It, it really did because it no matter what stupid thing happened in combat, and it's always it's always hilarious. It's always stupid. Um, you can go. It's still not as bad as when we hit the ammo plant in Milan, Tennessee. It's still not as bad as when we hit the mount site at Fort Knox, or mm -hmm. still not as bad <laughs> as uh, hitting Range Thirty Seven at Fort Bragg. Uh, so yeah, I'm very, very big on that. Next one is uh, go back to Leif LeBlanc. Uh, Leif LeBlanc. He's actually. Uh, got his mustard stain on his airborne wings. He jumped with the Rangers in the Panama. Outstanding. Uh, All right. Gr great guy, great guy. He actually, and he came, he's going to be, uh, he's one of my patrons. He jumped with us in uh, Florida when I jumped with my son. Uh, Sog is such a fantastic read. It was in my rucksack back in the day as well. Thank you for the trailblazing you gents did. True badass Americans, Rangers lead the way. Leaf, uh, thank <laughs> you for your service, brother. Yeah, that's okay. Leaf is a monster. They made him lose 
like 40 pounds before they'd let him come down to airborne school. And he really? got down there and he's, he's still, and he's solid. He's just a monster. So if we play the little video with us parachuting out of the C-47, you know, I lead the stick and then my son and Chad's after my son and Emery, our whole tactical rifleman stick. They get a whole right plane. You play it? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> But uh, when you get the Leaf LeBlanc going out, you know, he's in BDUs and everything. But when his parachute opens up, it's an orange cargo chute. It says Bob, B B O B, big orange ball on the, on the pack tray. And I'm like, E O B. And they're like, you'll see when it opens. It, it's got like 300 more square feet than everybody else's chutes. And he still landed before I did. Funny stuff. No his, sec- his second jump, they put him in a regular chute. It was inverted. Yeah. yeah. Oh, backwards. God. Yeah. No. So, yeah. He, he, yeah. yeah. But he and, landed um, on the concrete next yeah. to the building. And then his third jump. He Did he break some, the concrete? Uh, pro- almost. No. Oh, we, had a good time. we had a good time. He's strong. All right. Next one strong is like uh, Daniel Berry. Just wondering if John, John, or Carl has any thoughts on defending Taiwan. Lock- likeliness of success or failure. Good idea, bad idea. Any potential lessons learned from Vietnam or Korea? You guys uh, understand what he's hinting at? That, oh, right. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, what is your opinion? That's, that's your theater. Um, mm. And I would say that, you know, I, well, you know, I've been an American. I've served 25 years. I've done this. I've done that. But it really does vary by culture and different parts of the planet and just the way like uh, the the Vietnamese and the Japanese soldiers treated prisoners from World War II to Vietnam and the the Koreans and the Chinese treated prisoners is completely different than how the Japanese completely They're all communists. Yes. But 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 as well mostly with the uh, soldiers in the Middle East they, they do it different so my take on that is Completely inaccurate compared to your view. From dealing with Taiwan, what do you what do you think the odds are of China not knuckling under if we decided to defend? I first of all, I've been both to Taiwan a couple okay. times and to PRC China. Okay. Um, until recently, China was not really much of a threat. Mm-hmm. They didn't have the capability to project yeah. power. Yeah. They did not have a high seas fleet. They had not trained much in amphibious operations, but they're they're working their way up to that Very capability. Much so. Yes, sir, without a doubt. And without a doubt. And they're starting to say things like, "You better let us do what we want, or else." I've read about Australia recently, where they've just plain told them, warn them, if you try to work against us, it could mean violence. No. They really? Say, they said that to, to Australia. Yes. Wow. Wow. That's oh, a yeah. big deal. It was a blatant threat. I wow. think they are starting to believe their own BS. Yeah. But on the other hand, they have a tremendous number of troops under arms. Mm-hmm. And if their technology is as good as they claim it is, mm-hmm. it'd be a tough fight. And I, you know, I used to, I, like you said, uh, 10 years ago, we wouldn't even be having this conversation right. because, yes, they have so many troops. But uh, they don't have body armor, they don't have body armor, they don't have this, they don't have that. And uh, my whole time in the military growing up, the so former Soviet Union, they always copied all of our aircraft. Their MiGs looked like our fighters, you know. Right, they have right. an aircraft that looks just like an F-15. And uh, their, even their cargo planes were designed to look like a C-141 or uh, this, that, and the other. Uh, so when I saw China had a copy of the F-22 Raptor, our state-of-the-art stealth fighter. Um, I was, just happened, I don't remember whether it was at SHOT Show or somewhere, but there was somebody there from Jane's, you know, the guys that do the mm-hmm. books. And these are right. outside of the government, they're not loyal to either flag. Right, right, right. These guys, no shit, gather data. And I was like, well, you know, it's, it's they're just copying, they're reverse engineering our F-22, but it'll never be as good as our F-22 because, because the Russian stuff never was. Right. But, he, and he, he reached out, he put his hand on my knees. Like, he's like, no, hey, actually, you know, yes, they reverse engineer everything, but understand it's your American government and the American capitalists that are having all your chips made in China, that are making your iPhones in China, that are making all the 
HP and Dell and all your computers are being made in China. So there's not a lot that they have to reverse engineer and they, they're not actually getting the answers from. And he's like, I've seen the air shows. I've seen them both. And he's like, I, right now, and this guy was not, he was not an American. Uh, but he's like, I would take their fighter over your F-22. And I, and I, you know, and I wanted to punch him in the throat, you know. Um, I did the Green Beret thing to kind of, you know, pump. I'm like, Psh, yeah, fine, whatever, you know. America is always going to be best. But it stuck with me deep inside that I've always had that one-sided view because we're, after World War II, the Soviets were always um, more, you know, we'll make a thousand T-34 tanks for every one German Tiger tank. They, they, they did that. And where we relied getting into Korea, Vietnam, and since then, we've always been, we'll, we've always had the technological edge over the enemy. And uh, our night vision w was always the best. Our fighters were always the best. And... One thing that I've seen is since Vietnam, and you guys had air superiority, right. but it was not a unchallenged airspace. And there was, there, there were a number of aircraft yes. early on. Yeah. That's why Top Gun was created, because yeah. just playing for, for dogfighting, yeah. we'd, we'd become so wrapped up in technology mm -hmm. and missiles. Yeah that they'd forgotten how to dogfight. Well, I was no longer being instructed. Yep. Well, so I get to like the initial invasion of Afghanistan and right about the time Kandahar was starting to happen, my troop got pulled out. We're sitting in, um, it was Oman. No, we were sitting in Qatar. And uh, there's a flight of F-16s there. You know, you got the fighter pilots. They all got their silk scarves. Right, and, right, right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're in the bar there because the Air Force is allowed to have a bar. We're not. But we're there. They're mad at us because all the Air Force chicks like the Green Berets. But um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's laws of It physics. just happens, yeah. Well, yeah. these air, these F-16 pilots, they're like, well, you know, we're, we're fighter pilots. And I'm like. Not really, dude. To me, you're the smallest bomber in the air. You know, you can carry four 2,000-pound bombs. And I've got a B-52 that can go up there, keep refueling, and that plane can stay there 48 hours. Literally, they, you can keep refueling a B-52, and he's got more bombs than all of your F-16s sitting at this table. And uh, my, my <laughs> point, by, and of course, I'm just, I'm poking these, these pilots with a stick to piss them off. But the reality <laughs> is that airspace has never been challenged. Air superiority has never been challenged my entire time in the military. And um, like I, I just did a test on the, the next generation squad weapon to replace, uh, this is actually uh, one of the company's submissions. It's 6.8 ammo. And uh, it's designed, and I can't, I can't get into the capabilities of it, but basically it needs to be able to defeat level four body armor at distance. And why are we looking in that direction? And it, if we go to anything crazy, uh, what, whatever the caliber is, uh, it, the whole point of it is down, Everybody trains last war, and we do need to stop thinking about cavemen in Afghanistan. We need to stop thinking about, uh, and we need to start looking at the next war. And if the next war is a conventional battlefield, um, it, it really could get ugly. It, it really could, really could. So. Well, I will cite a quote from Stalin. Quantity has a quality of its own. It does. Because he had been speaking in terms of German quality yeah. tanks mm -hmm. versus Russian tanks. Yeah. But quantity has a quality of its own. Without a doubt. With enough quantity, your quality doesn't matter. And that's what I always loved about um, Americans, World War II specifically. I like to study history. Um, the Russians had their T-34s. Okay, we had, the, we had the old M4 Sherman. And I know you don't like the Sherman, but we had a shit ton of Shermans. Right, right. But again, <laughs> and they were gasoline thing. powered. Yep. They were, they were. Yep. Uh, and if and so here we were winning World War Two with that same technology, that that same, ta uh, the same tactics. Right, right. Wall right. quantity over quality. Exactly. And then here we are, basically since then, relying 
sometimes too heavily on the technological edge. We're always going to have the technological edge. Okay, maybe, except now we don't have it anymore. The, when it comes to uh, Star Wars, when it comes to cyber warfare, you know, we have Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and the President Trump just started this Space Force that everybody laughed at. But the, the Russian, not Russians, the Chinese have Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and cyber warfare. They're, that's a whole separate branch. Mm -hmm. And that's somebody that's taking it a little more serious than us. So, um, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. So, back to Taiwan. Good idea, bad idea, fair fight, not fair fight? Uh, I, I, I bow to the historian because um, it's worrisome. And I don't know how much defense Taiwan has. Taiwan it's an needs to develop yeah. their own nuclear weapons. If they're ever going to truly deter China, they're going to have to have nukes. That might deter China. But conventional forces alone... Yeah, no, they don't stand a chance. No. no. I mean, literally. All right, we'll see. And I, honest, guys, I, I pray to God we never see it in our lifetimes as sin sincerely... Everybody jokes about it. Everybody, uh, we've got people out there that they, we're waiting for the boogaloo. We're waiting for the boogaloo. We want to, we want to overthrow the government. They're coming for our guns. Guys, pl please don't pray that you ever have to shoot a gun on American soil. Buford T. Justice um, is, uh, <laughs> uh, he didn't have a comment or nothing. Uh no. But a name. Buford, no, he's a he is a great American. You guys would want to buy him beer. He is He drives right. a Pontiac Firebird too? Uh no. Buford <laughs> is uh he's one of my closest friends. Uh, he teaches the dark arts, uh dirty fighting, um, lone operator type stuff, how to be the gray man behind enemy lines. Uh his unit actually to teach him how to be invisible in the city. Put him living with the homeless, I think it was Baltimore or somewhere, and he was there for over 30 days before the homeless people accepted him as one of their own. And then his unit left him there for 15 more days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's Ooh. some rough shit right there. <sighs> Buford, I love you, brother. You know I that's love cold. you. cold. I love you. For John, somebody in the chat said, uh, Crazy Cuban, how you been, Vermont? Need anything to you? Not... Off Which John? You got two Johns. I asked him. No, I, I, sh I shook off. I, I've known a couple Cubans. Maybe he's talking about another John in the chat. No. <laughs> no, it's us. No. Hmm. I just didn't know if you, if you remembered him. Hey, listen, the older I get, the less I remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're going to need more the, than that. The longer the fish get. Yeah. <laughs> oh, funny stuff. All right. Um... John, what's new in your life? You're, besides you doing the uh, doing the, the the podcasts and uh, just making these guys in the historical uh, <laughs> documents here. No, I, I, I want this man to be immortal. I do. He needs to be immortalized. That's right. I do. You need to, bro. I, I have re received more recognition than I deserve. There's so many guys. I write about they uh, You know, uh, I, I hear that all the time. Now, see, when I say it, it's the truth. Because I'm literally, I'm that regular guy that never did anything. Oh, cut it out. <laughs> no, but I'm serious. But I was surrounded by decent people. Flag but, on the play. But Absolute bullshit. Yeah, but these guys, John's like, yeah, man, this guy did this and this. And, this, and everybody else around you guys are like, yeah, ask him about this when the NBA yeah. guy reached up and grabbed him by the foot on the riverbank. Oh, yes. And ask him about the time he detonated the claymores to knock the front wheel out of a truck. Yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> stuck a guy's arms inside the front of his shirt to, 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 to make splints. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, this is awesome, dude. It's awesome. See, I'm Good a wimp stuff. compared to John. I was, I was only in the country 19 months. He was there for over three years. I mean, my God. And that, and at the time with Flying Cubby, the whole thing about having a Cubby rider, that is one of the things that doesn't... We never get played up enough in the books. Yeah, for sure. Because you tell the story, you say, declare the prairie fire emergency, we made contact with Cubby, then we directed air assets. Well, yeah. we is these guys. And then he gets the word to the pilot, and they work it. And uh, 
And that was the only, that was you talking, you couldn't talk to anybody else. You could only talk to Covey or right, because of like different, that. Yeah. different. Well, it would depend. Yeah. I mean, there are times when you, you hit the emergency free, right. like Eldon did, yeah. and picked them up incidentally. Yeah. And there are a few times when we, when Covey was in between fueling or the airborne command was now, what I mean, elsewhere. though, is um, like when, when I took my sniper team in the initial invasion of Afghanistan, um, we went in with a SATCOM radio and literally spotting scope with the night owl <laughs> night vision hooked on the back of it, digital camera hooked to that, cable down to the tough book computer, cable from there to the SATCOM radio. How many radio. rucksacks did you have oh, to dear, carry all that dear, shit? My gear, my <laughs> four-man team, three of us are gear with weapon, vest, and rucksack. Three of us are gear weight. 122 pounds the other guy weighed 120 and i'm moving like batteries from one guy and you're allowed one mre spoon and you know your water and your chow and but my point though <laughs> is then the, the satcom <laughs> antenna but we could literally send pictures back to tampa you know we could we could if uh and it was supposed to be a three-day mission so i brought five days worth of chow and batteries and then i think it was like night nine we were finally like look you don't get us tonight. Tomorrow's no comms link up. Uh, literally, my, my combo guys got the voltmeter and the batteries. He's oh, like, you didn't have the hand generator like we uh, had? No, shit, no. Because that's, because <laughs> you, why would it's you bring that? You know, yeah. we brought five days for a three day mission. Kid. <laughs> but um, I knew at any given moment if, if they threw 100 guys up against the mountain, I could, at any given moment, my combo guy could point the SATCOM antenna at the satellite. Um, and literally five bars, click, point it, turn it on, and I had five bars. I could talk anywhere on the planet. If that failed, we had the Iridium sap phone, and it was a crappy signal, but l literally I could have called my wife from the hide site. And, uh, what good would that do you? Yeah, she just, <laughs> when you're coming home, pick up some milk on the way home. Why did you do that wrong? But... Um, <laughs> God, I don't know if you realize this. At night, if there wasn't an aircraft rover, we had no combo. We turned off the radio yeah, no, to conserve you, you, batteries. You, yeah, yeah. you always lost calm in comms in the dark, and we would always blame people for falling asleep uh, uh, on radio watch. But the reality <laughs> where, uh, was the way the ionosphere is set up and reflecting radio waves. Blah 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 blah. Antenna theory. But the reality is these guys did not have access to all the technology that we have today. So having that aircraft up there, man. It, that was the lifeline. Uh, you, you were, the you, only you, one. You were their lifeline. Uh, Absolutely. The Covey, Covey, oh, yeah. Covey Riders. Today it is, um, if you got into trouble, they would always have the AWACS plane up. And um, we talked about Anaconda. Uh, I mentioned it a little while ago. There was a time period where the a, the AWACS plane had to pull off before the next one came on, and it was, we're only going to be gone twenty minutes. No big deal. Well, that was right when the big battle happened. <laughs> but the Air Force <laughs> still had a J Stars plane up there, which is just filled with computer people sitting there, and they kind of filled the role for a little while. When the sun goes down, uh, that's when we... The snakes crawl at night. AC-130s, <laughs> yeah. I'm the bravest guy on the planet once the sun goes down, AC-130s. But in a conventional battle, we lose that air superiority. But they're, we're used to thinking uh, air, sea, and land, and we are missing out on... Um, the battlefield's three-dimensional, but the next generation of, of warfare, it's cyber. Yes, it's cyber, but it's also, uh, they'll immediately erase all of our GPS satellites, all mm -hmm. of our communication satellites. That has been tested and, before. Uh, yes. Desert Storm, we were the only ones that had GPS satellites. We were the, we were the only ones. At any given moment, we knew uh, that... All they had to do was throw a switch, and unless you had crypto in your GPS, your GPS would only be good for like a, a thousand meters. Everybody else's, and uh, 
they never did that because nobody else, a bad guy, Saddam was never using GPSs and all of our cars here in the U.S., every, everybody, there ain't an American in, the U, in here that can read a map anymore. Everybody, Google Maps, everything. So we'll <laughs> never turn it off. We'll, but it doesn't matter anymore because we could literally turn off all of our GPS satellites. The Chinese have their own network. And so you drop our satellites, our communication satellites. So now we got to think cyber. we got to think satellites. Uh, but n then you get into drone warfare. And um, it's one thing to shoot down an aircraft. It's another thing to send that missile to shoot down a swarm of drones. You get one. There's mm. 90 of them that are talking to each other. And that technology is there today. Uh, tactics uh, that are being used today is literally, um, I take the drone this big off the back of your body armor. I sit it. And it's got a little 19 gram shape charge in it. And I fly it up and blow a hole in the roof. And then I take the next one off your back and I fly it through the hole in the roof. I find a bad guy and we can talk to him through the drone. You need to come out. You come out. At what point do you have the third one that has well, a nine when, millimeter automatic? Well, when on he it. shoots, <laughs> when he shoots the drone with his AK, you take the third one off and you send it in with the 19 gram shape charge and drop it in his lap you kill him yes, yes. Um, but those <laughs> tactics guys are being used today so um it's changing it's, and the chinese have been yeah. spending a lot of money yes on killer drones and killer yeah. robots yes without a doubt without a doubt so we'll we'll see uh uh squirrely stuff coming up oh, i got one here from an anonymous donor named jeremy uh, I'm not supposed to give the names of anonymous donors, so let's not do that. Shh, don't say his last name. We won't say Jeremy. Jeremy's name. Bal no. Balcazar. Don't say. Don't don't say that out loud. <laughs> All right. Uh, for John S. and John L., when you first arrived in Vietnam, at what point did the reality of war set in? Thank you for your service. Casualties. When you see guys that it's not like the movies. There's no theme music in the background, and someone has taken a hit from a small arm fire, and you see yourself what the result yeah. is. That's, you it's, know, since from it, that this point is, on. It's not, a, uh, it's not a number anymore. This is actually one of your friends. This is somebody you know. That's right. Yeah, for our um, night, our first night at the Trang at the uh, SF headquarters, 5th Special Forces Group headquarters, we had incoming uh, Viet Cong mortared, and it hit the Indige barracks next to ours. And there were several KIAs, and of course, all the debris hit our roof, and we all ran downstairs. The weapons room was locked, of course, hmm. being a being yeah. rear echelon yeah. mothers. Yeah. And then we just ran out to the wall and hung out there for a while. It was just let us know that we were in a war zone. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, it's uh, wow, wow, casualties. Once you see what it does. Yeah. I was surprised oh. how terrible a single bullet could do the damage. Mm -hmm. Because I'd been watching, growing up at that time, watching combat on TV, yeah. a series, yeah. and somebody would be shot, and there'd be like a little hole here, and mm -hmm. there's no exit wound. Yeah, they never That is an huge. Wound. Yeah. And, and he said there's blood and so on, but not reality, not yeah. even close. And, and Hollywood always says that, well, we're gonna make it realistic, make, make it realistic, but uh, they don't. The, the explosions are always big fireballs, where reality is that's not how an explosion works. No. It's, uh, it, There's it never moves. a concussion yeah, wave. Never. Uh, <laughs> it, real the explosives, that shock wave moves so fast, there's no time for fire. <clears throat> and, yes. uh, you know all the gore and guts. It's it's all jackassery. It really there's, there's nothing realistic about uh, warm. And I, I know the Hollywood people hate to hear that because they you know they bring in seals and uh, everybody to be advisors. But uh, yeah, sometimes I think they're bringing the wrong people in and they don't listen to the right people about certain things. Uh, and I don't think depicting it. It's it, like cheap you know, drama. It's like that flaming they bars. Don't, they don't need to. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the the movie Saving Private Ryan, the generation before you guys, the the greatest American generation, World War II veterans. Uh, my neighbor over here, Buck, may he rest in peace. 
he made the, he lived right next to me, and we lived in a little suburbia back then, and uh, he had made the D-Day landing. He was on the second wave of landing, so the beach was already secure, and uh, he was a wire rat. His job was to run wire from pole to pole. His whole basic load was, he had two extra mags for his Thompson. No, it was M1, uh, M1 carbine. And uh, never fired around. The only time his rifle was ever shot was some German guy drunk grabbed his rifle and shot it in the air. Um, <laughs> but he, he, no, but that was his war story. Uh, but he said, um, well, the, the D-Day landing, uh, Remember, he landed after the beach was already secure. He, he actually had the general on the on the landing craft with him. Hmm. Now, I have spilt whole Bloody Marys in the, the Gulf of Mexico, drunk as a skunk, standing there in my bathing suit with my little church pistol hanging off the front of my bathing suit. And I've spilt drinks into the Gulf of Mexico, and it's immediately gone, right? Uh, Buck told me when he landed on the beach, he said the water was still red. red. How many, and I, I thought about that, how many strawberry daiquiris, how many Bloody Marys, how many drinks would I have to spill to turn uh, the Gulf of Mexico beach at Gulf Shores, Alabama, that color red, and the amount of uh, American and allied blood uh, it, it just had to be nutso. But uh, he tried to go see the movie Saving Private Ryan, and he told me he didn't make it through. You know, the first scene is right. the landing. Oh, yeah. And uh, he, he said he couldn't he couldn't take it, l literally. And uh, just just watching that scene, and uh, we we have a we have a lot of viewers here that are that are veterans and. Uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of vets because we've been at war for 20 years now. So right. we, we've got a lot of guys that have seen some incredibly tragic stuff, and a lot of them are having problems. We have a lot of disabled vets, uh, but a lot of vets that are uh, really really bad in their heads, and they don't have a lot of friends. They don't have anybody to listen to them. So um, we're very big on supporting them. You guys know the deal. Hell, I've, I've given my personal phone number to so many guys so that they could call and just have somebody to talk to. But what was that like? Um, and well, what is it still to, you, like you for you You got something guys? in common now. We have some, another tragic commonality with Afghanistan veterans. Yeah. We're walking out on our allies. And our interpreters left behind. Yeah. I mean, we have April... John and I will never live down April 30th, 1975. Absolutely yeah. not. I wept that The day that Saigon fell. Yeah. Yep. And we knew All that the, the people, then Frank Snapp did done. the book, yeah. in decent interval, that talked about how the CIA never destroyed the records so that when the commerce took over those offices, there's the records of a lot of our people. Mm -hmm. the, the agents, yeah. the sources. The... Yeah. Oh, that sucks. And that's going on today. It's going on right now in right Afghanistan. Now. Yep. Um, and, and of course, the you, State Department. Have not you to any mention doubt? All the women that have been brought out of their burqas and allowed to go back to schools, a lot of them, their whole lives, they never knew the Taliban. Uh, uh, right, they could be oppression. 20 years old. Yeah, they'd be 20 Good years Lord. old now. So they've already graduated uh, high school and you know they're working in hospitals and now they've, they've got to go back to living like sheep. See, they're this, getting educated. This yeah. would actually be the third time. Because first time was China, in 1949, we we ended aid to China, yeah, and that is when Mao won. Yeah, sad. The Soviets were priding. Yeah, incredible um, aid. So, but th there are a, you guys coming back from the war zones and stuff. Um, you yeah, you guys know other Vietnam vets. So there are a lot of Vietnam vets that are having. Uh, post-traumatic stress and stuff like that. I I had a, the the doctor that actually diagnosed me with this stuff. He he's like, um, Carl, you dream about. I'm like, yeah, but these are pleasant dreams, you know. Uh, knocking the guy off the wall at 80 feet with the minigun, right? These are pleasant dreams. Uh, but he <laughs> not like, for normal people. Yeah, well, <laughs> but he's like, no, you don't understand. He's like, my generation, we had. The Vietnam vets come back and they said they didn't have any issues either. 
But for a lot of them, it was two, three, four years later, they'd start having nightmares and all this stuff. Right. And by then, the VA didn't give a shit about them anymore. Correct. Yep. Um, did you see a lot of that? Do you still see a lot of that now? I know people that, including myself, I have terrible nightmares sometimes. Man. I usually win the gunfight, but you usually win. The... <laughs> <laughs> but not always. That's, That's why I love you, John. That's why I love you. Jerry's um, over here trying to get me to get these books signed so he can buy them. Jerry, I've had this book over ten you're, you're years. You're not giving up your you're book. You're not getting no. this book. John Plaster signed that book in 2008 while I was in Afghanistan or Iraq. You're not getting my book. <laughs> okay, what you can do is go to my website. That's what I wanted you to give him. UltimateSniper.com. And we sell both of these books, SOG and Secret Commandos, in soft cover. They are in print. And soft cover. before the end of the year. Soft cover. Indeed. Well, but they're large size, soft cover. But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, Simon and Schuster came out with them again a year ago, and they're available and very moderately priced. Guys, and I got a I got a pimp, um, John Stryker Myers, two books also, and uh, they're great. I read them; they're excellent. Uh, eventually, thank you. <laughs> eventually, I'm gonna write my book. It's gonna be called War Stories: A Comedy, because guys, honest guys, I didn't do nothing compared to y'all. Well, y'all did some out. squirrely, oh. stupid shit, man. Guys, if you've never read this book right here, this is <clears throat> comic relief. Yeah. There is humorous stuff. There, it's in hilarious. All, it's all humor. I laughed my ass from cover to cover in this thing because it is just the amazing stuff that these gentlemen did right here. It's just crazy. Didn't you exfil off a, a LZ on the wing of a Cobra? No, but somebody at CCN who, did. Who, what book who was, was it? Maybe that was just a... It might be in here. This is... Um, uh, I remember reading about a story of somebody... Clinging to the wing of an old cobra. Right. Well, they had they had, in and they had the ammo compartments. The doors yeah. open. Lynn, as Lynn Black on October fifth. <laughs> I don't know where I heard the story, but it just popped in my head. You, you heard it. You heard it. You heard it in chapter six of uh, Cross the Fence. I did. The, uh, yeah. I did. Yeah. Okay. Did. There was Lynn Black and another team member um, because the awesome Jolly stuff. Green picked up after the second, the third Jolly Green crashed. Yeah. Another one came in, picked up everybody, but Lynn and the other guy had to come out in the Cobra. And they ran on, and they rode on the, the gun rack and they strapped him in. Jesus. And they froze their balls off. And I, yeah, I, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I know that there was a Cobra pilot that was picked up that way. Yes. One of our Cobras that got shot down. Got shot down. And uh, number two came in. I don't remember what happened because there are two, two crewmen on a yeah. Cobra, but one came out. Wearing a McGuire rig, <laughs> strapped in the yep. best he could on on the yeah. Cobra skid. You know, there's yeah. actually been uh, I know of at least one case here in the global war on terror, and I believe it was in Afghanistan, where um, guys were extracted uh, by by an Apache, and there ain't no skids to stand no. on on an Apache. No, but literally the pilot came in, is like, I I'm all you got. <laughs> Hold no. on wherever you can. And they, they actually exfilled the guys. Hang on to my 20 mic, Mike, huh? Yeah, I do something. Put your foot up on oh the rocket. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hanging on the rocket. When, when talking about outrageous, incredible stories, this was a CCS guy, Graham. Robert oh, yeah, Graham. Robert Graham, sure. Uh, he is undoubtedly the only American in the war that exchanged fire with the NVA with a hunting bow. <laughs> yeah. He had he had his father back in Canada. He was a Canuck. Yeah. But uh, and he was a one zero team leader. It's done yeah. at CCS. Yeah. He cool. uh he, he was intended to use it as a silent weapon. Yeah. Essential For, takeout, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He tried originally <laughs> using Montagnard crossbows. Yeah. But despite the use of the John Wayne movie, they aren't yeah, really that. No, it's okay to accurate. shoot little yeah, I little birds shot one or something. Once, yeah. Okay, they're not they're really very good. <laughs> so he got a hunting bow, and I mean, he had like the the three bladed yeah broadheads, broadheads, yeah. the whole thing, and uh, he got in contact, which, well into the contact, at one point he finally got pissed off, jumped up screaming, and fired an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> And then obviously he got back down rather yeah. quickly. But he said, well, you know, and I actually have a picture of him getting off the helicopter with his bow. It's in uh, 
<laughs> my SOG photo history book. But anyways, um, about, God knows, I don't know, uh, 2005, yeah. 2005, he was working at a radio relay site in Afghanistan in support of the war. Yeah. And he had to come down for some reason. He's walking along the edge of an airfield. And somebody looked at him and said, you're that fucker with the bow. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's what happens. I mean, talk about being crazy. Double crazy in this crazy. case. I actually have got a, a bow story, not, not actually that. Yeah, pretty well that bad. You guys will love the um, initial invasion of Iraq. So this is probably 2003, beginning of four. SF base getting mortar fire across the Euphrates River. Colonel Kelly, battalion commander out there. Command Sergeant Major V. Hill. And um, yeah, this was 2000, 2004. Receiving mortar fire coming across the river. And you can see the poo. Poo. The, you can see the light on the other side. Well, the, the conventional guys, they're all, you know, body armor, flak jackets. Nobody had body armor back then. They're all hugging the ground. And it's just tense. All of a sudden, the tent flap flies open, and Sularu, that's Sularu right there in the middle. This, the group picture was taken, uh, this Sue's one in nuts. Kandahar Airport. <laughs> but Sue had left my A-team, and uh, he's a big mountain man. So he had a takedown recurve bow that we would practice with because on deployments, you, you're getting ready to go home. A lot of times, we'd get home in time for deer season. Sure. So he was a big... He practiced with his take sharp. down, re, take down recurve bow. Well, he's also a nutbag. Sularu is, <laughs> he's full blown nutbag. Six foot four, red, flaming red hair, deserted from uh, the French Foreign Legion, just total nutbag. He throws open the tent flap, comes out in black ranger panties, and that's it. And he's got his Viking helmet on. <laughs> He's got his recurve bow, and on the end of his arrow, he's got a tampon from one of the Red Cross care packages. He lights it on fire, pulls it back, and launches it across the river. And the colonel goes, Sue, what are you doing? And Sue looks over at the colonel and goes, counter battery fire, sir. And he turned and went back into the tent and closed the flop. And Colonel <laughs> Kelly's like, please, God, somebody tell me you got a picture of that. Uh -huh. Nobody got a picture of it. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just you can't make up shit like that. You just can't make it up. Mm. Um, so never actually shot it at a bad guy, I guess. But uh, yeah, got another one here. Uh, right. John Massey said, "Mr. Plaster, do you remember Tom Tangleleg from Route Arizona back?" Oh, Recon route Team 70. Arizona. I probably yeah, should. Route, route, route Arizona, route. 1970. No, Recon Team. Don't worry about it. That usually is route. <laughs> In the civilian world. I, I I really wish I could, but that was 50 years ago. I can't remember every <laughs> I, 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 No, don't I, remember him. Well, if, uh, if he served there, hats off to him, but... Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, without That's a, a half did, century. Did That's that like again? trying to ask, hey, do you remember that guy in 1900? And it's 1950. Yeah, I know. Uh, before yeah. they had airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> did you do this uh, one? Um, I don't know. Randy Clayton asked, any chance you could tell the group how you spent your stand down time from Ashtray 2 with RT Vermont and how it started? RT Ooh. Vermont was Doug Miller's team. Okay. The Medal of Honor recipient. Yeah. Well, the yeah. people called Franklin Miller, but he used his middle name. Okay. Well, I'd come back and I'm in the club, which that was the greatest spot, the best classroom we had for learning from other teams. Yeah, the bar they, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. they'd be at the bar talking about, well, okay, and, and I mean, they said, well, here's a, a glass there, and they were coming this, you know. Yeah. But yeah. but it was real shit the yeah. same day that it happened. Yeah. So I'd done a little bit of that. I went over to uh, Miller, and he's sitting in there with Glenn Uyamura, my best friend, mm -hmm. who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, they're talking about their next mission. I said, well, when are you going in? He says, tomorrow. I said, wow. Yeah. Next thing I know, we're having drinks together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, well, here's the deal. 
The only time we've ever had guys rappel into a target was when they were going after a downed aircraft. Bright light. Bright light. Yeah. He says, we're going to insert. That way we can insert some small little spot the enemy would never expect. And I have a couple of I said, shit, I want to go along on that. Can I go? <laughs> That's not the only time something like that happened. Ask, <laughs> ask Jim Storter how he ended up on the Halo team. <laughs> One of the Halo jumps. <laughs> but anyway, so the next day, sure as hell. We're up at Doc Toe and we launched. So we got you got onto the mission oh, yeah. the night prior yep. because you thought it was a good idea in the bar while they were drinking. <laughs> I think you guys would have learned your lesson volunteering the first time. Well, yeah. you know, yeah. at a certain Slow point, learning. it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> guys, there are uh, little vignettes. Little sh uh, this is uh. a book of little short stories. Well, wait, wait. Did you uh. repel in? Oh, uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway. <laughs> so we had... Four guys each and two aircraft. Okay. I was go and I wanted to make sure Glenn Uyamura didn't get killed, my best friend. Yeah, indeed. Best friend. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought it'd be interesting to go out with Miller because he'd already had the mission, of which yep. he was later awarded yeah. the Medal of Honor. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to see his techniques firsthand. <laughs> well, at least under alcohol, it sounded like a good idea. <laughs> but anyhow, so we go into hover, and this is a very dangerous area. It's not far from the bra, which was always full of NBA, just maybe four kilometers south of there. Highway, two kilometers, three kilometers north of where we're going in. And the, there's a, a bomb crater on the side of a hill. So the Huey, we didn't, he'd even instructed what to look for. So he goes over that bomb crater, and yeah, okay. They kick the bags out, weighted bags with a rope. Yeah, the ropes, yeah, rope bags. And, uh, I was, the name of the game was you don't go until you see the team leader go because he's the team leader. It's his decision, yep. and he might know more than you do. Yep. So I look it over. <laughs> there goes Miller. Zzz, zzz, yep. And I get down. Miller's down. Uwe Moore is down. And I look. And the one Montagnard who was with us, he made it about three feet and got scared. He wrapped his arms and legs around the skid on the oh, Huey. No. So they're hovering, 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 trying to talk, get, go, go, you're not going to die, go. But he wouldn't let go. Eventually he slid down so they, well, you know, you can't yeah. slide off the rope. You yeah. got the bag yeah. on yeah. So there he was flying away on the Huey. And we thought, ha, 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 bring in the next ship. It's starting to come in. Boom, 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 boom. Bad guys open up. <laughs> Bad luck. Uh, right away, we jump in that bomb crater. I, I, honest to God, we spent the next maybe six hours calling airstrikes around us. Like, danger close at times, <laughs> depending on their ordinance. 20 mic mic, we were 20 millimeter cannon fire, yeah. was 10, 5 meters away. Holy shit. And from time to time, we were throwing grenades. And at one point, I crawled out to put a claymore mine. And crawled back, which was about the scariest thing I've ever done. <laughs> and while we're sitting there in that bomb crater, I'm thinking, why the fuck did you volunteer for this? Sounded you didn't good. have to be here. It's bad enough you volunteered. You're in South, you're in Rita. <laughs> well, the bad thing was the NVA never actually attacked us in the bomb crater. They were just making a lot of ruckus because they wanted to get the helicopters coming in to pick us up. That was the target. So they had come in twice, and they went all the way back to Docto, refueled, came back out, heavy ground fire, they can't do it. One more time, all the time, we are putting in airstrikes around us. A1 yeah. Sky Raiders, uh, uh, Phantoms only had 20 millimeter, yeah. and Cobra gunships. Only 20 millimeter. Yeah. 20 millimeter well, I mean, they had 500 pound yeah. oh, bombs and so on, but you're not yeah, going to bring yeah, that danger bring that close. Yep. Unless you're insane. <laughs> <laughs> but then insane. An another insane. set of A1s come, and I'm looking, I'm saying, I'm looking to the north. They're just about over the trail. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. It's flak. Literal anti-aircraft anti guns no, exploding. Ac -ac. Ac -ac like World guns. War II ACAC. -ac. Yes, 37 wow. millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> because if those guns are there, that means Charlie is really yeah. there in great numbers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's probably very pissed off at us. 
So put in continuously for six hours, we put in airstrikes around us. And finally, it's getting late in the day, and they just got it okay from Saigon to use tear gas to blanket the area with yeah. cluster bomb tear yeah. gas. However, the, the crews, the Huey crews back at Docto do not have gas masks. So they're going to have to wait until they can be flown in gas masks from Play Coup, which is a solid hour flying away. So the, I have to give credit to that Huey leader. He said, screw that. It's going to be dark by then. We're going to give it another try. There are three guys on the ground. Yeah, just, just three. Glenn, and uh, Miller, and myself. All these guys. And, and we're holding off sitting bull and 7,000 <laughs> Sioux. So here comes a Huey. And instead of flying high with strings, yeah. he comes low so he can kick out ladders. And those ladders are probably about 20 feet. So we run, I mean, we aren't wasting any time. So I get on the left side, Glenn and Miller going up on the left. The nose is forward. And I get right up to the top. And I mean, it's, it's hard because you've got that lip over the yeah, top and yeah. you have to swing. And, mm -hmm. and the door gunners are all live fire. Boom, 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 right over our heads. And all of a sudden, the door gunner above me goes. <coughs> and I climb in. Shh, off we go. And once you get to, to altitude, it's like it never even happened. It's yeah. nice and quiet, yeah. but it's noisy. So we get back to uh, Doc Tone land. I uh, look at the door gunner with the air aircraft shut down. I say, yeah. hey, why would you jump back like that? He said, you didn't see the RPG? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> A bad guy had snuck up behind the aircraft yeah. and fired from the vicinity of the tail. And remember, the, the blades are about as high as the ceiling right oh, yeah, here. You don't, yeah. And it came between me and the blades. It arced whoosh, like that and detonated somewhere ahead. Oh, my God. That could have killed everybody in the <laughs> aircraft. He missed by a couple feet. Oh. So they hear <laughs> He jumped back. <laughs> just, just another day in SOG. Uh, hey, uh, listen, I, I salute <laughs> all those yeah. helicopter pilots, yeah, cubby with, pilots, A1 doubt, pilots. Ooh, without a They're doubt. without a question. We would not be here today. Oh, a lot of our friends. Fertilizer in Leos. Or it's never found. Like, you know, just. I love uh, reading oh. the stories, but hearing it firsthand, this is just awesome. That's the best. Awesome stuff. Oh. Don't, don't forget, too, just to change the topic for a second. After his time in SF, then he goes into Sniper, which you know a little bit yep. about. Yep. yep. And he worked with the legend, Carlos Hathcock. Carlos. I mean, Gunny that's one more topic yeah. we should at least have a couple minutes about that you guys know a lot about. I never got to the training part. Yeah. But there's an excellent book and some other stories. Of glory. And how many training schools did you work with over time? Many here and in Europe. I yeah. was also, I was rather proud of this, I was the uh, chief of competition for the European Police and Military Sniper Championships yeah. <laughs> held in the Czech Republic. Really? And it was cool. Yeah. We had Finns that came in. Those guys were damn nice. good shots. But they had the old Finnish version of the Mosin Nagat. Yeah. But they were nicely built. Yeah. But I was able to actually, from scratch, design the course and then run. Of course, I had yeah. some great support, yeah. other guys there. Uh, and our guys from, how can I, I don't want to mention the name of the organization. Yeah, because they don't exist. Because yeah. they don't exist, but they took first place. Nice. That's no, awesome. really? Yeah, and they just had to be from somewhere in our user side. <laughs> just random, yeah. random Fort Bragg. Our guys did. And the Ukrainians tried to cheat. I caught them. I just well, cheated their asses. <laughs> of course. A Ukrainian, Ukrainian cheat? <laughs> no. Say no and, and I felt sorry for the guys with the SVDs. <laughs> yep. For all the hype you've heard about. There's the oh, yeah, SVD yeah, right yeah. there. It's not terrible. really very. At, at, terrible, beyond 400 terrible. meters, oh, they yeah. weren't even yeah, hardly hitting crap. the targets. Oh, and they, they, kick like a horse and says it's so light um guys what we're talking about is this was this was the um the sniper manual that we basically grew up with now when you go to like the all army sniper school at fort bragg you have field manual such and such such and such army sniper operations and sodic uh the special ops sniper school the handouts the books yes but um, those are military reference manuals, field manuals. And, um, 
and I had no idea you were the author of this. But <laughs> you every, read it so thoroughly. Literally, yeah. literally, every sniper instructor had this on his desk, literally, and they were all marked with uh, just lessons learned. No, literally, you marked the pages. Yeah. And um, like, like I, I flipped through, and literally, I get, I'm big on giving books away. So um, mine, after I had already soaked it all in, had been given to some other regular army guy. But uh, if you're not familiar with this, and you guys are you want to be a sniper, the tactical side of precision rifle, because there, there's all kinds of great precision rifle guys out there now in schools, and I'm not taking anything away from them. Um, and if you want to hit the one mile target and you want to read winds and you want to talk about the effects of Coriolis and changes in barometric pressure and density altitude, blah, 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 this, blah, blah, you know, how many minutes of angle a thousand feet of change in elevation does to the trajectory of the, the round, you can get into that in a thousand different places. But uh, one of the things that I liked about your book is it's literally not just about the ballistics. It has a lot to do with the sniper operations and uh, just simple things like how do you spot the officer in the group of enemy soldiers? And there's just so much stuff that people take for granted. And uh, I was taught uh, all the conventional military sniper courses and I had been taught all of this stuff, but this is the only place where I saw it all plugged together, much better organized than the way the Army does their manuals. And um, I could tell that you're, you're not just a guy recur regurgitating stuff that he had read somewhere else on the internet. And that, the internet when I wrote the first then, version in 1993, yeah, yeah. Um, there was nothing on the internet. There was nothing. Um, <laughs> but literally, as far as reference manuals go, guys, if you don't have this and you like precision rifle side of the house, um, I'm a member of the One Mile Club. I have knocked down a steel plate at a mile in Gillette, Wyoming. whoop de doo um, My furthest kill is 461 meters, um, which is nothing according to all the military. So, wow, in fact, the Canadian sniper got a two-mile one. Mine was three guys uh, in the dark moving targets with a SR-25, and the first one was a headshot, which sounds awesome, except I was aiming at the guy in front of him, and that guy stepped Carlos Hathcock once told uh, me yeah. that he got all these kills. Yeah. He said, no one reports the misses. Exactly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Carlos true. would know. <laughs> um, my point, though, is I and by no means a subject matter expert on this stuff at all, but I consider myself having a educated opinion. And <laughs> this book right here, uh, The Ultimate Sniper, and uh, its author, this is good stuff right here, brother. I, ha I have to mention that it has been out of print since the pub publisher, Paladin Press, went yeah. out of business a couple years ago. And they did, yeah. It is coming back into print later this year. Nice. Nice. All right. And, there you go. and there's your answer, people. And the SOG photo history is coming back into <laughs> nice. print as well. At last. And my wife will kill me if I don't mention this. And I run scared from her. Okay. At times. Yeah, no, smart dude. Man. Her, uh, her, smart her, man, smart man. Her Happy email smart address man. begins Rifle Girl. Rifle so Girl. I hope I never regret teaching Rifle her how to shoot. Rifle Girl at <laughs> Photon. Protonmail.com. No. no, I don't give your okay. full. This don't the, give her full address. The don't website is ultimatesniper.com. Just, Ultimate just like the book. All right, ultimatesniper.com. And yeah, great stuff. Great stuff indeed. Any of you guys getting ready to go to school? This got me through U.S. Army Sniper School. I bought this when I was in uh, Iraq, knowing I was on orders for sniper school. I bought this and I read it through and... I didn't finish the top of my class, but pretty damn close, so. There you go. All right. There you go. There you go. Our hero. There Buy you his go. book. <laughs> Buy his book. When we it love, comes out. We love having Chad in the peanut gallery off to the side. Indeed. All right. Somebody's dinging my phone. Um, blah, 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 blah. One of our patrons has said... Um, uh, can you get the rest of the books on the Amazon store so I can link them? Yes. Um, yeah, we'll actually do that. What I'll, what I'll do for you is I'll add all, I'll add these books.
that we don't already have listed. I'll put them on, on our Amazon store. If you go to tacticalrifleman.com, guys, uh, we have a page that says companies we love. You, you can sign up for our classes and everything, but there are uh, certain companies that we enjoy doing business with, ATS Tactical Gear. Uh, stuff like that, but I also have what's called the Amazon store. I don't I'll love mention. Amazon, but the advantage of having an Amazon store is I can list specific book books <laughs> with a link. Yeah. And what it allows me to do is ensure you guys get the correct book, not just something with a similar title. So it works out very good. And last one, uh, what a cool show. You all doing awesome. The stories are wild. Um, Cool. All right. Uh, I have to mention appreciate. one thing. I saw one of the uh, emails come yep. out. A guy looked at uh, Amazon. You can look at eBay as well. And this book, even though it's out, out of print, some people bought them, sat on them, and now it's like it's a collector's item. Oh, without a doubt. Well, this individual just saw that it was $333. And there was Ooh. another one for 900 Oh, they're crazy. Yeah. How much are you selling yours for? Six six hundred. No. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be they they'll be well under a hundred bucks. Yeah. Maybe fifty. Okay. I, I don't know. But wait until the end of the year. End of the year. Christmas time. Christmas, yeah. All right, taking bids on my old 2008 copy. No, I'm just kidding. You can't get this out of my hands. Yeah, you get them. You gotta buy a new motorcycle, <laughs> no, right? No, no, no. You can't get that out of my hands. I knew right where it was. My wife helped me find the other book because I didn't know where that one was, but she found that one. <laughs> so. All right, gents, I appreciate you coming in. Uh, yeah, we have to go awesome. because Chad's got awesome having Chad's got here. another assignment tomorrow. We got to hit hit the road. He's got another assignment tomorrow. Yep. Hey, tell them where, where they can find this thing we're doing tomorrow. We're taping. Tell them when they yes. can find um, it. Yes, right now. The Sawcast. If you just go to my website, Saw Chronicles, the first four Sawcasts are posted there. And uh, working through Jocko, pa, uh, Jocko Willing pa, uh, Productions, more will be posted, but all the posting is up to them. We just do the recordings and turn everything over to him and his right-hand man, Echo Charles. Cool but part. right now, the first four will be posted on our website. And these are audio, so for all my truckers out there, you guys are on the road. You don't you understand? I don't like that you are watching videos while you're driving those big rigs on the highway. You guys can listen to the stories. And there'll be video down the road. Right. And then, yes, yeah. later on, uh, cool. just go to sawchronicles.com. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. All right, well, hey, before you guys take off, we're going to wrap it up tonight. If I if we didn't get to your question again, I'm sorry. Uh, I, go to know. the website, send us an email. You got his website, you oh, got yeah, mine. For, for sure. And we'll, we'll get back Leave to you. Leave your questions in the comment section underneath this video. You guys know I read all the comments. I want to give a big thank you to our big sponsors again tonight. Title sponsor, Sportsman's Guide, Big Daddy Unlimited, Global Ordnance, 80% Arms. Make sure you get your... your uh, 80% firearms because Sloppy Joe hates them. Right? <laughs> and, um, and then uh, check out Safe, uh, Safe Life Defense. They've got plenty of body armor in stock. Great stuff indeed. John, a pleasure meeting you. And I so. want to mention thank you for con continuing the great traditions of SOG. We respect you guys. Well, thank you we so do. much. We do. It's mutual. Without a doubt. John, thank Airborne. you for bringing this guy by. My pleasure. That's why. Uh, <laughs> Thank you guys for your continued support. You guys know the deal. We will see you. Uh, we'll see you next time. And uh, y'all take care and shoot straight. Shoot straight, really. Good.